You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. 75 years ago exactly this weekend, Allied commanders received the surrender of Japanese fascism, which had massacred tens of millions in their own hinterland of fellow Asians and had treated the captive prisoners of war of the Allied armies with bestial awfulness. Even civilians in Singapore and in Burma that fell into their hands were treated worse than animals. I've seen the bridge on the River Kwai quite a few times, actually. Now, for those of you who think all of that is ancient history, it was precisely to the day nine years before I was born. That's right, it's my birthday. My son checked with the Guinness Book of Records and I'm the only 66-year-old man in history to score a hat-trick in a proper game on his 66th birthday. Talking about long ago, Margaret Thatcher, Milk Snatcher. You remember that one? If you do, then you're showing your age. If you don't, I'm going to tell you a thing or two about her in just a few minutes. I have no idea why she's trending, literally no idea. But as soon as she trended, up popped me and the comments that I had to make on BBC and in Parliament on her demise. And speaking of Tory Prime Ministers, where is Boris Johnson? We've got the worst recession in the world and the worst coronavirus death rate in the world. Where is he? He's on holiday. Strap yourselves in. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. This is Radio Sputnik. And this is London, but coming to you, of course, all over the world, thanks to the wonders of the internet and sputniknews.com. You can listen to us with crystal clarity on FM, but only if you're living in the Washington, D.C. area. 105.5 are the numbers there. You can listen on AM from Burning City to Burning City, right across America. You can listen right across the world on sputniknews.com. But if you're one of the half a million people who are now regularly every week watching as well as listening to the mother of all talk shows, the Open University of the Airwaves, then welcome. And you can watch on Facebook and on YouTube and on Twitter and on Instagram and a plethora of other platforms, the names uh, of which mean absolutely nothing to me. I, You know, when, 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 you get, when you get to my age, you no longer celebrate birthdays, you curse them. Uh, but I cursed it with a hat trick, in a proper match this very morning. And uh, as I said earlier, it's something apparently of a record. Now, where was I? Um, had I got to Margaret Thatcher yet? Well, let me start with Margaret Thatcher. For some reason, totally unknown to me, still unknown to me, she began trending in the last 24 hours on social media. And as soon as she did, uh, then my own battles with her began to pop up on social media, one of which you'll see in uh, just a minute. It was, for some unaccountable reason, the last time I got invited back onto the BBC. Maybe once you've seen it, you'll understand why. Margaret Thatcher and her successors, uh, which we still live under today, she gave birth to uh, a new form of social and economic order in Britain. And 
you can see the result. And so what I'm about to say about her is not just personal, though it is, of course, personal, uh, but uh, she and John Major and Tony Blair and Gordon Brown and David Cameron and Theresa May and, of course, Boris Johnson are all a seamless garment of Thatcherism. So we've been living under Thatcherism since 1979 and it's 2020. That is a long time for a political era to last. It's an era uh, that uh, excoriates public and uh, uh, worships private. It's an era that thinks that government uh, should be uh, striving for inequality. There's no other way to put it in a week when uh, school pupils uh, were marked down uh, according to their postcode, while at Eton, absolutely nobody was marked down at all. There's no longer any pretense, is what I'm saying, that Britain is a class-ridden, class-divided society, and that those that have uh, make hay, and those that have not uh, are in trouble in the periodic uh, sloths that we are now entering into, the worst in the entire world. 20% of our entire GDP has just disappeared in three months. The largest fall in our own history and the largest in the entire world. So how's that for a double whammy under Boris Johnson, the latest Thatcherite? We have the worst economic crash and the worst coronavirus uh, statistics, not just deaths, but hospitalizations and cases. And that's, of course, a good time to go on holiday, isn't it? At least that's what uh, Boris Johnson concluded, uh, because at this time of trial and on the 75th anniversary, about which more in a minute, of the end of the Second World War, our Prime Minister is on a beach somewhere. We must hope that he paid for the trip himself, unlike the last one, although we still don't know who actually did pay for it. But Margaret Thatcher started it all. And we got early warning, those of us done certain age, when she stole the third of a pint of milk every day that children got in our schools. One of my first slogans on a march was Margaret Thatcher, milk snatcher. Now, for kids like me, uh, that milk and the free school meals uh, that followed it uh, were uh, crucially important. I would not be the fine figure of a man scoring hat-tricks at 66 if it weren't for the cod liver oil and the orange juice and even the malt that they gave me to build me up. I'll need to stop taking that. The era of free milk, the era of cod liver oil and orange juice was destroyed by Margaret Thatcher. Let me just give you one example. I was the Labour Party boss in the city of Dundee when Margaret Thatcher decreed uh, that council houses must be sold to the sitting tenants for a pittance at a massive discount. And we said, no, we refused to do it. Our council, our party refused to do it. We had the bad luck of having an SNP MP in half of the city. Gordon Wilson was his name. He led the Thatcherite attack on us for refusing to sell council houses. Those of you watching, listening in Scotland, wise up on these matters. It was the SNP that were Thatcher's mouthpiece in Dundee on the subject of the sale of council houses. Now, is there anybody left in this country who does not now agree that selling off hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of council houses, building no new ones, has been a disaster for the housing market in this country? Not many, I think. It's a bit like the Iraq war. You cannot find anybody now that will say it was a good thing. Although I felt quite lonely when I was one of the very few people saying that it wouldn't be. Margaret Thatcher 
tore the social fabric of this country to shreds. She closed uh, whole industries that once made us the workshop of the world. She reversed the industrial revolution in Britain. She destroyed more manufacturing capacity in Britain than the Luftwaffe had managed to do throughout the entire course of the Blitz. 30% of our manufacturing capacity was destroyed by Thatcherism. Whole communities were utterly decimated, destroyed, reduced to a slag heap, a social slag heap of unemployment, drug addiction, crime, where once they had been bustling, beating hearts of the indigenous community of Britain. Places like Barnsley, places like Sheffield, places across what became known as the Red Wall, places in West Central Scotland that were once factories employing tens of thousands of people that if they were lucky were now turned into a shopping mall, if unlucky, simply leveled with grass put down and called a country park. If I sound like I hate Margaret Thatcher, I do, but I hate her heirs and successors even more. Because at least Mrs. Thatcher was honest. She told you who she stood for, who she represented, and what she was going to do to you. The wolves in sheep's clothing are the wolves that I despise the most. And you know those wolves to whom I refer. The greatest legacy of Margaret Thatcher was Tony Blair. You don't have to take my word for that. You can take hers. When asked her greatest achievement, Mrs. Thatcher answered, Tony Blair, a new Labour. Now, I talked about the Luftwaffe. That was all over 75 years ago this weekend. On this weekend, the Allied commanders received the surrender of Japanese fascism, which had literally raped and massacred and pillaged its way across all of Asia that it was able to defile. And they have never atoned for the gigantic fascistic war crimes that they committed. Never mind atoned, they have never even apologized for the great crimes that they committed against the people of China, of Korea, of Vietnam, of Malaya, of Singapore, of Indonesia, uh, Burma, all these places. Uh, that they occupied and literally put to the sword millions of civilians. It's almost unknown, in this country at least, uh, that the country that lost the second largest number of people in the Second World War after the then Soviet Union was China. China lost perhaps 10 million people at the hands of Japanese fascism. The Japanese fascists took over Korea and literally dragooned uh, the women as camp following prostitutes with no say in the matter and certainly not even payment. They were sex slaves. The sex enslavement of hundreds of thousands of Korean women the putting to the sword of fellow Asians in the tens of millions is largely unknown in this country and maybe not many people even care about it. But if you watch the bridge on the River Kwai, as I did every Christmas for many, many years, I had a friend who was a Japanese car dealer, God rest his soul, Colin Gay his name was. He told me how uh, crestfallen he was every Christmas when he looked in the TV schedules uh, to discover that 
The bridge over the River Kwai was on the TV again because he knew that for the next two weeks he wouldn't be selling many Japanese cars. The bestial way uh, that Japanese fascism treated its prisoners of war, who were entitled to certain protections under the Geneva Conventions, uh, is still, or ought to still, be a burning issue in international politics. And I'm asking you the simple question, how come Japan was never punished for all of this, but was in fact endlessly rewarded by the United States in particular, was built up, forgiven, and built up largely as a counterbalance and maybe even a sword one day to be used against China. I'm sure that other people have got a different point of view on that, but if you are, as I am, of a certain age, uh, the Second World War is important uh, because the world we have now is the result of that Second World War. The life in which I grew up, I grew up under the shadow of the Second World War, and it's widely known, or ought to be, of that our country wrote its name in the stars, particularly in the early part of the war when we stood entirely alone, with Hitler at the channel ports, with the SNP leaders collaborating with the Hitlerites at the channel ports. I'm not gonna let you forget these things, don't worry about it. When we stood alone and only the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy were the difference between us as a free people and us as a subjugated, crushed, occupied, Nazified country. These are important things to me. They ought to be important things to you. It's a pity uh, that they are not more widely discussed. We'll be talking, of course, about the Russian vaccine. Sputnik V has illuminated the landscape with all the brightness that the original Sputnik did when it went into orbit, beating everyone on the planet and becoming the first craft to leave the Earth's atmosphere and to orbit the Earth. It was in 1957, so I was only three. I didn't have uh, the reading skills then that I have now. But I have always known uh, that the attitude of the West to this great Russian technological achievement was marked by jealousy and churlishness and hate. And guess what? So has the reaction uh, to Sputnik V, the new vaccine that the Russians have produced against the coronavirus. It's so safe, the president of Russia gave it to his daughter. It's so safe, it's already on the market. It's registered. And all the gnashing of teeth and wailing and rending of garments amongst the Western pharmaceutical giants, the Western countries that thought they had it in the bag and what a cash bag it would have been. They'd have been selling it now, this weekend, up the market for plenty if they had won the race to develop the vaccine. We've got a poll running. Will you take the Russian COVID vaccine? A, yes, B, no, C, wait for the UK one. Well, my answer is A, yes. If they want to fly one now to the Russian embassy in London, I'll go in and take it and report back to you next week as to the efficacy of it. We'll be talking, of course, uh, to the wonderful Katie Halper. Uh, you can't get a more uh, royalty, American royalty than Katie. She'll be talking about the current state of American politics, of American coronavirus, of the Epstein scandal and the Ghislaine Maxwell trials and uh, so on. We'll be talking also about the disaster uh, that the coronavirus plus uh, the pitiful governance that we have in London and in Edinburgh, which has devastated our children's schooling. You got marked down plenty if you came from a council house like me. 
You didn't get marked down at all. If you were at Eton, I think that probably says it all. Let me finish my monologue with giving you just one of the many videos of me on Thatcher that have been circulating this mysterious week when Mrs. Thatcher came back from the grave and trended on social media. Take a look. We're joined now from College Green by the Respect MP George Galloway, who doesn't want PMQs to be cancelled on Wednesday. George Galloway, why not? Well, you've managed to assemble the only three people uh, in one room uh, in the entire country that think it's all right that we're spending £10 million on the canonisation of this wicked woman, this woman who laid waste to industrial Britain, to the north, to Scotland, to South Wales. We've already had the recall of Parliament last week with MPs being paid up to £3,700 to fly back from the Caribbean holiday that they were on and then fly back to start their holiday again for a totally unnecessary fawning over this woman. Well, George and now Galloway... they want to cancel Prime Minister's questions. It's absurd. Right, George Galloway, I mean, she was Prime Minister for 11 and a half years. She well, won three... Mr. Well, hang on a second. She won three general elections. Surely she is a big enough political figure, whether you like her or not, to merit such a ceremony. Mr Wilson won four general elections. Mr Attlee totally transformed the country in the wake of the Second World War. Neither of those had anything remotely like this, this tidal wave of guff that the country's been forced to listen to, particularly on the BBC. And when they bought Ding Dong, the witch is dead, you censored it as the only means they had of expressing their own rejection uh, of all of this. The comparison of Margaret Thatcher with Mr Churchill is utterly absurd. We'd be conducting this conversation in German if it was not for Mr Churchill. He saved the very existence of this country, while Mrs Thatcher did her best to destroy what was good about this country and did destroy more than a third of our manufacturing capacity, reducing us to the state we're in now. All right, People are very angry in Britain, and it's not reflected in your studio, and it's not reflected on the BBC. Right, but George, George Galloway, you're reflecting it very clearly and it's loudly. The first time from you've had me on in one college. week. She what? died one week ago. Hundreds of thousands right. of people have been following me on social media, but I never got one invitation to speak on the BBC. I think you're <laughs> it was cut and uh, no more. But thanks to BBC Politics and Joe Coburn uh, for that uh, moment or two of, I hope you think, magic. Uh, I never did get back and now that programme is no more and I'm sincerely sorry for that. Poll one, will you take the Russian COVID vaccine? A, yes, 35%. B, no, 55%. C, wait for the UK one, 10%. You can vote now on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. Katie Halper's up next, but let me do some social media. Uh, will says, I won't take any COVID vaccine. He doesn't say why. He doesn't say if he'd prefer not to have the smallpox one. If he'd prefer not to have the diphtheria one, the tuberculosis one, or any of the others that he undoubtedly took uh, as a child. AP6 says, I'm not sure I'd be happy taking any vaccine, regardless of its country of origin. And on Facebook, Rene says, happy birthday, Mr. Galloway. May you have many more. How very kind of you, Rene. Thank you. Talia says, Boris is hiding in a fridge somewhere. I suspect he's somewhere a bit warmer than a fridge. And Maya says, Thatcher for the Hall of Shame. Now, there's an idea. Isn't she already in the Hall of Shame? I think she's already in it. Uh, Heather says, I agree, selling off council houses was a total disaster. Yes, Heather, you are right. And on Twitter, Filza says, on the 14th of August, Pakistan was born. On the 15th of August, India was born. But on the 16th of August, a legend was born. Happy birthday, George. Thank you, dear Filza. And by email, uh, Tony says, Boris and his cabinet have been disastrous for the UK. One crisis after another. Now, it, is, uh, having, uh, it, has, it has been a totally extraordinary week in the United States. You might well say it always is. Kamala Harris got the gig a very highly controversial person, as Katie will no doubt uh, educate us. 
Uh, and given that Joe Biden with the kindest uh, intentions in the world, I'd have to say is unlikely to complete his term as president of the United States. Kamala Harris is who you're actually voting for to be the president of the United States. A woman who had to leave the Democratic Party primaries because she could barely get over 1% of the vote. Yet by patronage, Biden has picked her. And if the people vote Trump out, Kamala Harris is a very weak heartbeat away from the presidency. Let's take a quick call on Mrs. Thatcher. Brian is in Cornwall. Brian, welcome. Yeah, happy birthday, George. Yes, Thank you. Uh, I spoke to you before, but not only Thatcher did she sell all the council houses, you know, they, they sold all the pieces of land everywhere, all the, all, any bit of land that, 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 that they sold. And they didn't sell it to build council houses on it. They sold it to the oil inspector to build nice posh houses on it. And some of this land was, was, was what the travellers used to go on this land. Well, it was common land. We used to go on it and we used to stop on these places. And there's no places for the travellers to stop now because Thatcher sold it all. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, of course, that uh, didn't stop with uh, Thatcher. Uh, when I was one of the non-payers of the poll tax, I was one of the leading figures in the movement uh, against the poll tax. And when we eventually brought her down over the poll tax, uh, we might have hoped for a change of direction at the top wow. in British politics. But actually, the course continued as before under Conservative and Labour Prime Ministers, didn't it? Exactly. George, I don't, like, like I'm not very well educated like, like them, but I, I'm a businessman, I've been in business all my life. And as you know, I got the plan permission in the end, in my place on a Brownfield site, and I built my house. But I'm paying nearly £300 a month council tax for the house I'm living in. Now, if these people, if these, these, these so-called councillors are supposed to be really brains of Britain, really, really odd people, <laughs> Trust if me they had not. any sense, if they had any sense, if I had some land, I'd say, build the houses. I'm getting £300 a month for every house. Do you understand what I mean? I do. They I feel no your brain. pain. I feel your pain. And uh, the, the travellers are uh, much put upon in uh, many parts of the country. And I'm always uh, sympathetic to you, Brian, as you know. You've been a regular uh, on the show. Thanks uh, very much again for uh, joining us. So the Russian vaccine is going down one. Yes, 34%. No, 54%. That's also down one, by the way. Uh, wait for the UK one, 12%, up two. I'd be interested in your reasoning for that. Why would you be uh, more happy to take a UK vaccine than a Russian one? I'd really love you uh, to call me now. Let me take a quick break and then it'll be Katie Halper. Ah, Katie's here now. Excellent. Katie, welcome to the show. It's always a delight to see you, even though the subjects we have to discuss are often uh, distressing. Let's start with the one of the most distressing. It's Kamala Harris for president. Oh, what yeah. say you? I mean, I really was upset that it wasn't Karen Bass, although I knew it basically wasn't going to be because she was too progressive and she got really red baited by uh, the media. Um, yeah, Kam Kamala Harris is, um, she's even kind of less of a ideologically committed person than Biden. So she'll just go really wherever the donors push her. Um, I think that if the left had any leverage, there would be the real potential to actually push her in the right direction, which would be in the left direction. But sadly, I don't know if we have any. So um, while in theory, I think she's much more malleable than others, um, I don't know how the left will compete with the corporate interests and the donors that are shaping her agenda so far. She's on the face of it quite uh, an electable figure, though, isn't she? She's a woman. She's a woman of color. Uh, indeed, I think she has two uh, different ethnic uh, backgrounds. Uh, right. And, uh, and uh, she can certainly talk a lot better than her boss, Joe Biden. Yeah, 
Right, but that the lo the bar is really low there. But yeah, she can I think form complete sentences better. She doesn't look like she's about to pass out um, mid sentence the way that uh, Biden does. Yeah, I mean I think I think the idea of having a woman of color is great. I think that unfortunately the way she uh, her policies affected women of color and people of color uh, was not in a positive way. Uh, she, as people may know, actually went after parents for truancy. So when their kids weren't in school. She um, locked them up for that, uh, which is a pretty draconian, cruel thing to do. Um, and it's not really the norm and certainly not in uh, Northern California, uh, the state of California, which is where she was uh, attorney general. So she's done a lot of things that uh, I think are really problematic for the left. And now, of course, the left is in this position for people who think that Trump is worse than Biden. Uh, what are what are we supposed to do? And I think that we actually have to keep pushing them because pushing them to the left isn't just the right thing to do morally, but I think it makes them more electable. And you have a uh, Democratic Party who won't which won't even embrace Medicare for all on an aspirational level. They won't even put it into their uh, platform. And some people say, well, who cares? It's just symbolic. But I actually think it's very encouraging that people like Ro Khanna and Rashida Tlaib are refusing to vote for a platform that doesn't have Medicare for all. I mean, I don't understand how anyone could have that and think that they have any moral vision or clarity, especially in the time of COVID. I mean, I don't know what more you could need to make the case for why we need Medicare for all. So um, I don't know. It's depressing. It's almost like this primary didn't happen for the, the powerful Dems, for, you know, people like Pelosi, who just gave a donation, by the way, to Joe Kennedy, who's running against a much more progressive incumbent, and Markey, um, for people like Biden, who is not, uh, not only is he not running on Medicare mm -hmm. for all, but, uh, you know, the, the DNC is not even embracing it again on an aspirational level. Um, I think Kamala Harris is a little bit better in terms of what she wants to do in terms of giving money to people. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a third party person usually, but I honestly think, I don't know what is going to move the Democrats to the left besides some kind of threat. Well, if, if all that wasn't uh, bad enough, uh, Hillary Clinton says she's ready to serve in uh, Joe Biden's administration. Uh, what do you think she might have in mind? Um, I don't know. Maybe Secretary of State again, so we can have some more wars. Uh, maybe like more Libyas. Maybe we can have some more slave mar open, open some more slave markets um, in other countries the way we did, um, the way we helped do in Libya. Uh, you know, yes, she can. Yes, we can. That that little girl with me. All of these inspiring uh, slogans hopefully can be applied to, uh, you know, ruining other countries, regime change. That'll be nice to see. No, uh, I think uh, that uh, Donald Trump will, will have some fun with that. Uh, they already uh, they had an attack ad out within minutes uh, of, uh, of Biden's announcement. Uh, I saw it. I thought it was a particularly powerful one. Uh, once the Trumpites, and they've got big money, uh, get to work on Sleepy Joe and, uh, and Sneaky Kamala, uh, yeah. I, I, I think that, that Trump's position just suddenly got a little bit better. Well, I do think that watching that, that very kind of um, confrontational back and forth that Kamala Harris had with Biden, I think is probably pretty good PR and pretty good fodder for people who want to criticize them. Because, you know, either they were lying then or they're lying now. You know, Kamala famously, you know, made T-shirts that said that little girl was me to highlight Biden's, and it wasn't an atrocious position on busing. I mean, Biden was terrible on busing, and he even had the nerve to say that the reason he opposed busing, which is basically integrating schools, the reason he opposed that was because it was a rejection of black is beautiful. Like, he pretended that he was doing it from some radical Black Panther type position, which is just laughable. Um, but yeah, I think that, I mean, you know, this is not totally what we're talking about, but it's to me, it's symbolic. I mean, the good thing is that he didn't go with... Um, that he didn't go with um, uh, Rice, Susan Rice. That's the one. That's the one. I guess uh, that's the one silver lining of this. Yeah. But I don't know she will. Should... She will too be in the administration. No right. Doubt. She will. She will. So who cares? I guess it just means. I guess we can count our, our lucky stars that she won't be the president. Um, and I do honestly think that Kamala Harris could be pushed to be less hawkish than like. Someone like Susan Rice as a president is an extreme ideologue. I don't think she's that movable. I do think Harris is. I mean, I don't know which is better, 
having an ideology or not having one. Um, again, if the left can actually use some leverage, then there's something that could actually come from it. But um, I don't know if you saw Susan Rice tweeted out, um, Trump said that he would consider uh, pardoning Snowden. And I think her response was, I just can't. This is what the GOP has become, which is just unbelievable that she's letting that all the high high ranking, you know, the uh, intelligence community, the DNC, all these people are basically letting Trump be the liberal on this. They're letting him outflank them on the left on this issue. Like Snowden is a whistleblower. And the fact that people are more angry at Snowden than they are at the people who engaged in the surveillance, illegal surveillance, and in the, um, you know, uh, the, the other things that he documented and that Chelsea Manning documented and Julian Assange helped uh, reveal and highlight is just atrocious. And this is just a basic tenet of liberalism. You know, you don't have to be a radical, you don't have to be a Marxist to believe that whistleblowing is a good thing, to believe in um, freedom of the press. So watching these people, Again, I love it. The same people who think that we're bringing freedom and democracy abroad through regime change and exporting our way of life somehow don't get that they're looking like total authoritarians. Yeah. Um, do you think Trump is serious about pardoning Snowden? And if he is, uh, it, does this give us any hope for, for poor Julian Assange? I don't know. I mean, Trump is so, you know, he's so bad on, on this stuff. And he really is a, quite a thug himself when it comes to human rights, uh, freedom of the press and all that stuff. Um, but he also is a pretty good troll. So I, I am always hopeful that he will, even if it's for the wrong reasons, maybe do something like that. And it would be great if he did that with Assange, too. But, you know, unfortunately, Mike Pompeo, I mean, not surprisingly, really hates Assange. And as people know, I, you know, Max Blumenthal, who's been on, on this show, I believe uh, did a really, really great report on how the CIA basically conspired with the Spanish um, uh, contractor to spy on Julian Assange. Um, they tried to get, they actually smuggled out his baby's dirty diapers to try to get a DNA sample from it. Um, they probably, they did a lot of really terrible things. And that also was at the behest um, of uh, Sheldon Adelson. Uh, part of this, you know, absolutely ghoulish uh, group of people, of neocons, uh, including Pompeo and Adelson. So, and yes. Pompeo has the honesty to say what, we lied, we cheated, we stole in the CIA as members of the, as part of the CIA. He says that that's what they do. So, well, no one, I mean, no, no one no. could fault him for uh, lack of honesty in that regard. Right. He was exactly. uh, he was being blindingly uh, honest. Right. In that regard, let's talk for a minute or two about Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, he lost his uh, his younger brother today. Uh, yeah. He's down in the polls. Uh, do you think he's uh, dispirited or m might the latest twists on the Democratic side have given him another spring in his step? I mean, anything could happen, honestly. I think that the Dems, if, if, if Biden wins, it will be because... Uh, thanks to luck and circumstances and not particularly to his strength as a candidate. I certainly think that a, a, a bad sign is uh, when you're running by basically sleeping through the election season and spending time in a basement. Um, I don't see Trump really becoming dispirited by anything, honestly. I think he probably, whenever something bad happens, it just he doubles down uh, whenever he feels insecure. I think the post office thing is really scary. And I want to give a shout out to Brent Welder, who was a um, tried to introduce some amendments, anti-corruption amendments and anti-lobbyist amendments to the DNC on uh, the Rules Committee. And of course, of course, he was that was voted against. Um, but he's encouraging people to just uh, that the Dems should just be impeaching DeJoy um, instead of it, like totally delusionally hoping he would resign or Trump would do anything to them to him. But as he pointed out in a tweet, you know, the Dems are busy and at their homes uh, calling donors instead of rallying around this issue. And that, of course, is something that's extremely scary, um, the post office issue, the, the, um, the U.S. Postal Service. But it, it's not as sexy or easy as an issue as Trump is evil, Trump is in bed with Putin, Trump is um, terrible on COVID. And, you know, even though this is probably the most egregious and damning thing uh, in terms of voting um, interference and intervention, for some reason, the media is not, you know, talking about it. They finally are. The Democrats are finally talking about it, but they're a little slow on the uptake. And it really is incredible that this hasn't been the kind of the thing that people coalesced around earlier. And so hopefully they will.
KJ Halper, always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for joining us on board the mother of all talk shows. Now, we've got this poll running. Will you take the Russian COVID vaccine? If you haven't voted yet and there's a big vote in, uh, then take a look at my RT shot this week. See if it changes your mind. Sputnik 5 has illuminated the world, just like its namesake, the original Sputnik, the first craft ever to leave the Earth's atmosphere and orbit the world. And the reaction has been exactly the same as it was way back then. Churlishness, jealousness, the world reaction is made of green cheese. The green cheese of jealousy that they did not develop the COVID-19 vaccine first, despite the billions of dollars that have been expended in the United States, in Germany, in Britain, all over the Western world, there was a madcap scramble to come up with the first COVID-19 vaccine. But slowly, quietly, and with determination, just like when they launched the original Sputnik, it happened first in Moscow. A devastating pandemic that has cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and has afflicted millions in every corner of the earth can now be stopped in its tracks with an immunity for two years. The Western press reaction was all about Russian claims even though the vaccine is actually now registered. And the president of Russia has said that his own daughter has been vaccinated with it. They've said that Russia is going to rush this product to the market. Even though, of course, if any Western pharmaceutical company had come up with it first, it would have been rushed, all right, and definitely to the market. It would have cost thousands of dollars for a shot of any other vaccine. I don't know what Russia is going to charge for Sputnik V, but it would be a remarkably clever diplomatic and political move to provide it to the world at an affordable price. Because this pandemic has been outside of world war, the most devastating blow that human society has ever faced. It has caused not just cataclysmic death and illness rates across the world it has devastated the economy in britain for example we have just recorded our biggest recession in the country's history a drop of 20 percent of our gdp in just three months so the cost of covid is of course extreme and everybody knows it Everyone was looking for this vaccine. But the Russian military and the Russian government working on a basic scheme that is 20 years in the making, an attempt to try and stop the spread of the common cold, made their breakthrough and announced it with, you might say, typical Russian understatement. The president, Vladimir Putin, announced that his own daughter had been vaccinated with it and was alive and well and feeling absolutely no side effects. And this is, of course, an important development. The possibility of severe side effects always haunts those who are seeking to develop vaccines. The level of immunity and for how long that um, immunity will last are other important issues. The Russians seemed to have solved them. No side effects and a two-year level of immunity is something of a miracle. But miracles do happen. And the Russian scientists responsible for the development of Sputnik V deserve the world's round of applause. We might even go out onto our streets on Thursday nights and clap for Russia. Uh, but of course, uh, that will not happen. Not only because they are bitter that it was Russia that got there first, but because they are bitter that they themselves will not now be able to profit mightily from that vaccine. Mind you, it's a real problem now for all the tinfoil hat brigade, the flat earthers, who denied that COVID-19 even existed and 
when forced to acknowledge its existence, claimed it was a conspiracy by somebody called Bill Gates, who's the new Rothschild for such people. Bill Gates, they said, had spread this so that he could corner the market in the vaccine. Well, the market is now Russia's and President Vladimir Putin's. Who would have thunk it? Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. So will you take the Russian COVID vaccine? A, yes, 36%, up two. B, no, 51%, down three. C, wait for the UK one, 13%, up one. Almost a thousand votes in so far. Vote on my Twitter feed at George Galloway. Now, uh, the coronavirus, uh, of course, has caused chaos uh, in Britain's schools, uh, north and south of the border, uh, which then led to the teachers having to estimate what grades uh, their pupils would have got if they had been able to sit their exams. And then the government of Boris Johnson, Gavin Williamson and Nicola Sturgeon and John Sweeney had decided that the teachers were hopelessly inflating the likely grades that their students uh, would have gotten. So they employed that dreaded thing, the algorithm. But the algorithm had an extraordinary antenna for class consciousness. Miraculously, it downgraded people in the poorest areas. It downgraded people in the schools which contained the poorest children by significant, massively more uh, than it downgraded the people in wealthy areas where the schools were filled with wealthier children. And in Eton, nobody got downgraded at all. It has caused absolute fury among students, their parents, and amongst teachers. And the Scottish Nationalist Education Minister almost got voted out of office in the Scottish Assembly in Holyrood uh, last week. He was only saved by the SNP's gardening section, uh, the so-called Green Party. They rode to his rescue and they may come to regret that uh, in the elections next year. Gavin Williamson, a man who shows all the signs to me of being a man whose grades were definitely hopelessly inflated. Don't tell him your name, Pike. He is Pike. But he's running the schools in England. And he made just as much of a cod of the whole thing as the SNP did in Scotland. So we want to talk about that with Claire Stranach, who's a secondary school teacher and who is a, a friend of mine uh, who knows her stuff. She's an activist, a trade unionist, and a great talker. Let me introduce you. If for the first time, it will not be the last to Claire Stranach. Claire, welcome uh, on to the mother of all talk shows. Um, have I summed up the English experience correctly? Oh, yeah. In fact, I'm wondering why I'm here, <laughs> because you completely nailed it. Um, I love the point about how it's got the algorithm. If it's got anything, it's got class at its root, because that's exactly how it's panned out. Um, and anyone who's not interested in class politics, I wonder how they're actually going to square that, because it's glaringly obvious. Um, I suppose all I want to do is flesh out really what you said and uh, and have made quite a, lot, a few notes here, George, and I hope that's not a problem for you. No. Um, I think the whole, the whole approach to the exams um, has been the same as they've approached everything, which has been a mixture of outright incompetence, but also uh, cynicism, uh, a real lack of interest in what's happening to ordinary people. Um, we saw it with the health service, um, and we've certainly seen it with these results, these A-level results. Front and centre, 
of the results this year should have been the teacher estimates, um, centre uh, assess grades. It has to be because we know the students better than anyone else. Better than any algorithm. Well, indeed. I'll come to the algorithm in a moment. But definitely better than, um, I, yeah, exactly. Any mathematical formula is not going to know those individual students as well as we do. And we hear all the time about grade inflation, which is a stick to beat teachers with. Occasionally, it may well be true. But that's why you have tiers of uh, exam boards and regulators and moderators. I mean, we are scrutinized to within a, an inch of our lives. It's part of the problem why I think there's, a, there's poor retention of teachers, because you're under a magnifying glass all the time. And say there had been some distortion of the grades, you've had four months to set it right. All this kicked off March. So do something about it. Get the teachers' grades, get the exam boards in the first instance to take a look, take a look at the historical data and deal with any obvious problems. I'm not exactly sure why they did that. Um, no, it, it, it's bamboozling uh, because any fool knoweth uh, and you who are an expert and a frontline uh, worker in the field you and others like you have been warning for months that this was a disaster waiting to happen. Indeed, indeed. Um, and so they came up with the algorithm, um, which is difficult now to say that word with any seriousness. Big Al, I call him. Big Al, let's go for Big Al, that works for me. Um, and it was kept really under wraps and still is. There's no transparency at all. The thing they demand from the rest of us, they don't, they don't deal in that for themselves. So it wasn't able to be um, analyzed or by professionals. So there's a great deal of concern around that. And now we know, I probably know, we know why, don't we? We know why. Um, really interestingly about the algorithm, the Royal Statistical Office um, offered to put forward their own algorithm but they were rebuffed unless they signed the national, um, sorry, unless they were prepared to sign a non-disclosure agreement that covered them for five years, which they refused to do. You think, wow, this is A-levels. It's not, you know, it's not state secrets. <laughs> it's so not, they nuclear, not nuclear weapons. Exactly. So they backed off and the government were on their own with it. Um, and as you've said, Suspiciously, it follows the lines of the privileged have come out well, and the large education, the sixth formers, the large group uh, providers have come out really badly. And within that, there have been um, bizarre results. That isn't even a consistent trend. There are bizarre irregularities, which, you know, we're talking about students who've come to the end of their formal educational journey and they're ready to go into apprenticeships, they're ready to go into college, they're ready to go into university, high stakes, and they've been left frustrated um, and bereft, really, in some cases. It's that serious. They've been cheated, just, really, haven't they? Say that again? They've been cheated. Oh, yeah, without, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, 30 to 40 percent of grades have been downgraded but interestingly the star day and a which are the top grades have actually risen in the private sector by 4.7 percent that's only matched by 0.3 percent in six form centers so you can see this idea of we're all in it together whoa no 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 we're not in all in this together at all and this is the cause of the angst this is the cause of the anger that that has been all over the media um and uh, can I also say about Gavin, not only has the system itself been iniquitous, it's what do you do next? Well, you can appeal. Well, why didn't they set up the appeals two weeks before they released the results? They could have sorted out any problems before the students got their results en masse. They've had the time. They haven't been marking exam papers. They must have the staff available. They haven't done that. I don't know why. Um, and then when they do come out, they say, well, you can appeal, which could cost up to £100 for an unsuccessful appealed paper. 
So then the government step in and say, oh, it's okay, we'll pay for it, which is going to cost us, the taxpayer, anything between eight and 11 million pounds. Wow. Just like that, the money's available. Um, then they talk about... And meanwhile, Claire, meanwhile, the kids uh, are, because they've been marked down, missing the, for example, university entrance, are missing the uh, chance to go to the university they thought they were going to be going to and must now scramble for an alternative. Well, I'd, I've read conflicting reports about this because the universities were, were asked to be generous uh, on the back of this. And I'd read they had been and lots of students had, had been accepted onto courses based on these, you know, um, insecure grades. But then I'm also reading actually certain universities are not being so generous, um, particularly perhaps the red brick, you, you know, the, the, the elite universities, should we say. Um, and there again, you think, well, there, there's the inequality in the system playing out for our students. Um, the, the, the element that they talked about to make this um, fair was the triple lock don't you just love the language the triple well, lock god that must that must be somewhere. really secure yeah. then yeah really secure and part of that triple lock would be the mock results and any practitioner in schools will tell you that you cannot use a mock result um to assess a student's grades um not all schools do them they use different papers it's just completely erroneous and then you feel that you're being led by a ship of fools um, because then you're now talking to people who know what the what what the system's like, and they, they're not even you know they're not they're not able to um, reassure us that they've got a handle on what's going on at all. In fact, somebody I wouldn't call politically you know politically to the left, should we say, has called it from Gavin uh, Williamson cavalier popularism. That just about sums it up, doesn't it? This yeah, cavalier. Well, I'm not sure that it's all that popular. Um, it certainly <laughs> isn't in Scotland where I've been following it uh, most closely. Alas, it's time for the news, Claire. So uh, this is the first time we've talked on this show. It will not be the last. Uh, you're our education expert from now on. We'll be following this story uh, as it develops. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Steve says, I see the denialist loons are out in force again, as is ridiculous russophobia. Tim says, why do we need a vaccine? Duh. Graham says, I won't be taking any vaccination for a virus with a 0.04% mortality rate. And Gar says, I had, I had been inoculated with different Russian or rather Soviet vaccines in the past and have not had any complaints, but I'm not sure about this one. Tell, tell us why, Gar. David says, I would certainly have the Russian vaccine, but under no circumstances will I trust or have any vaccine that our pathetic failure of a government has anything to do with or advises me to have because they cannot be trusted with anything. And Callum says, uh, the Russian vaccine hasn't been tested more than other COVID vaccines in development. Hence my reason for waiting for UK COVID vaccine. Billy says, I don't care about a vaccine. I'd like to know if it's more deadly than the flu. You're obviously a new viewer uh, or listener, Billy, because if you were not, you would have heard our me Moats medic, Dr. Ranjit Bra, destroy that uh, deadly urban myth a thousand times here on this show. And uh, on Twitter, Shadow says, happy birthday to the only true voice in politics. Wishing you many more to come. Thank you, Shadow. And on Facebook, Mark says, Trump is okay economically. It's just the rest of it uneducated, clearly. Uh, and Maya says, I'll take the vaccine, but only if the Tories and their families take it first. Well, President Putin's daughter uh, took it first. And uh, by email, David says, this is the point of the night, really. What a choice the Americans have, or should I say don't have, a clown or a corpse. Given the opportunity, I think I'd vote for Chance the Gardener. That was Chauncey Gardner, the model for Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Well, it's been a cracking first hour. I hope you agree. 
Much more to come in the second hour. Keith Best on the refugee dinghies coming across the channel that have got Nigel Farage knickers in a twist and looking at the whole issue of immigration and asylum and much more on the United States also. So stay tuned. I'll be back after the news with Jamie Lowe. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Tune in every Tuesday to Loud and Clear for a regular segment called False Profits, a weekly look at Wall Street and corporate capitalism, where we talk about the big economic issues of the week from the point of view of working people, the poor, and the U.S. position in the global economy. Join us this Tuesday and every Tuesday with financial policy analyst Daniel Sankey right here on Radio Sputnik. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. The British government and the exams regulator are being threatened with legal action as pressure mounts for a rethink over the awarding of A-level grades. Around 280,000 students saw their grades fall by one or more from their predicted results following the introduction of a new moderation algorithm, which was put in place after the coronavirus lockdown led to exams being cancelled. The majority of the students who were marked down were from poorer areas and the algorithm based its judgment on previous results from their schools. Education Secretary Gavin Williamson has been accused of abandoning his promise of a triple lock for students following the announcement of regulator Ofqual's criteria for using mock exams and appeals, although that has now been withdrawn. Earlier today, hundreds of students marched out of Parliament Square and headed to Williamson's department building. They were heard to shout, get Gav out and come out Gavin. In other news, Ireland has reported its largest daily number of new coronavirus cases since early May. It's announced 200 positive tests on Saturday in what the country's chief medical officer described as a deeply concerning development. There are multiple clusters and COVID-19 cases are rising in many parts of the country, Ronan Glynn said. The World Health Organization says 294,237 cases have been recorded worldwide in the last 24 hours and in total more than 21.4 million cases and over 771,000 deaths have been logged by the Johns Hopkins University. US President Donald Trump has paid tribute to his best friend and youngest brother following his death at 71. It's with a heavy heart I share that my wonderful brother Robert peacefully passed away tonight, he said in a statement on Saturday. The president had visited his brother in hospital in New York the day before his death, telling reporters he's having a hard time. It's unclear what caused Robert Trump's death, and he was the youngest of Fred and Mary Ann Trump's five children and was born two years after his brother Donald. The new leader of the Scottish Conservatives has apologised for missing a VJ event to work as a linesman at a football match. Douglas Ross said he was wrong to officiate at the Scottish Premiership game between Kilmarnock and St Johnston rather than attend a two-minute silence in his Moray constituency. It sparked criticism from opponents, including Labour MSP Neil Finlay. He said that the decision shows his appalling judgment and, quite frankly, his arrogance too. The apology comes less than two weeks after Ross was confirmed as the leader of the Scottish Conservatives following the resignation of Jackson Carlaw. Tens of thousands of opponents of Belarusian president President Alexander Lukashenko have gathered in Minsk to protest against disputed elections. The March for Freedom in the centre of the capital came amid growing anger over alleged poll rigging and police violence at subsequent protests. In an address to a smaller crowd of several thousand, Lukashenko blasted opponents as rats. He called on supporters to defend their country and independence. 
The rival rallies were taking place after Russia agreed to offer security assistance in case of external military threats to Belarus. It emerged that Lukashenko had twice spoken to President Vladimir Putin over the weekend. A female swimmer has broken the men's record for the number of cross-channel crossings and been assured her fears of falling foul of the UK-France quarantine rules are unfounded. Australian Chloe McArdle took 10 hours and 40 minutes to complete her 35th channel crossing after setting off from Kent on Saturday evening. She was worried that arriving in Calais would require her to self-isolate, but she said UK and French Coast Guards have given her the all-clear. The 35-year-old started her 21-mile swim from Abbott's Cliff Beach near Folkestone at 8pm on Saturday and arrived in France just before 7am. And finally, the US Pentagon is forming a new task force to investigate sightings of alleged UFOs that have been observed by US military aircraft. The new unit is expected to be officially unveiled in the next few days. Members of Congress and Pentagon officials have long expressed concerns about the appearance of unidentified aircraft that have flown over US military bases, posing a risk to military jets. There is no consensus on their origin, with some believing they may be drones potentially operated by earthly adversaries seeking to gather intelligence rather than extraterrestrial. Florida Senator Mark Rubio told the Miami radio station, we have things flying over our military bases and places where we are conducting military exercises and we don't know what it is and it isn't ours, so that's a legitimate question to ask. Videos released by the Pentagon appear to show unidentified flying objects rapidly moving while recorded by infrared cameras. Two of the videos contain service members reacting in awe at how quickly the objects are moving. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. Now, for a government that has just invited three million Hong Kong Chinese to come as migrants to Britain, where they're going to live, what they're going to work at, how they're going to get a place in a school or an appointment with the doctor or the dentist has not yet been explained, but three million Hong Kong Chinese have just been invited by Boris Johnson's government to come to Britain. Now, coming over the hill, three million of them. There seems an extraordinary huff and puff going on uh, over dinghies that are arriving on the south coast uh, from France. Now, I ain't no liberal bruv, as regular viewers and listeners already know. I don't accept that when you leave France, you're leaving a war-torn, devastated, ruined hinterland uh, to flee to safety in Britain. That's perfectly absurd. There is no war in France. It is not destroyed. So the strict interpretation of the legal position is that uh, these people are uh, fleeing from France to Britain, from a safe country to a safe country. But the legal position is only part of the picture. You see, every country must have borders, or it isn't a country. Every state must have immigration control, or it isn't a country. Only Trotskyites and liberals and anarchists believe in open borders. Every country has a right, a responsibility to control immigration into its country in an orderly way and in a way that can be absorbed productively by the society, by the economy. That's our right to do that. But every country has a responsibility to take refugees. And the more refugees you've caused, the more responsibility you have for the flow of refugees in the world. Now, just because we are an island and farther away from the action 
or the consequences of our actions doesn't mean that we can let France or Italy or Greece take all the refugees that have been produced by actions which in some cases had actually nothing whatsoever to do with countries like Greece. Greece didn't invade Iraq. Greece didn't invade Afghanistan. Greece didn't destroy Libya. Neither did Italy. So why are they paying the price of millions of refugees that are the direct result of government policies, including our own British government's policies? So we need a rational system whereby we take our share of the refugees. And we're not taking our share of the refugees. This has nothing to do with immigration. I'm fully in support of ending large-scale immigration into Britain. I'm talking about refugees, some of whom will be genuine refugees and some of whom will not will be economic migrants taking advantage of the route which exists for uh, the people trafficking, because that's what it is, uh, that is going on in France. Somebody is taking large sums of money from these poor people and putting them into a rubber dinghy and abandoning them in the English Channel. So. It's not as, dare I put it this way, black and white an issue, as Nigel Farage and other excited scribes at the southern coast of Britain uh, might lead you to believe. Keith Best, he ain't no liberal either. He's a former Tory MP. I remember him as a Tory MP and a former chief executive of the Immigration Advisory Service. Has agreed to join us now on the mother of all talk shows. Keith, very good to see you again. It's good um, to see you again, George, in a long time. Yes, indeed. Now, I've, I've laid out my cards. Where do you stand on the issue? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you if you wanted to have a, a, a hammer and tongs uh, argument, Never. because I agree with a lot of what you've just said by way of the introduction. I mean, I think you have to bear in mind, why is Britain such an attractive place? And it is very much the legacy of history. It is the fact that large numbers of people, if they speak a second language at all, it is English around the world. It is that many of those countries which generate refugees or have sad situations domestically in terms of civil wars and things like this are ones that have been either under the direct tutelage of Britain or have had a close uh, relationship with Britain. And of course, Britain has the reputation of being a liberal uh, society. And we don't have the same internal controls as, say, France or others. We don't require people to carry ID cards. We can't be stopped in a police state on the corner and asked to prove our identity at the whim of the, of the police. And that is an attractive proposition for many people. And I go over to Songat uh, in France regularly, and I see the asylum seekers there. And they are, of course, all fairly young, fit men. Uh, whereas the majority of the world's refugees are women and children who, if they're lucky, uh, fleeing from persecution, get across one international border and end up from Syria, say, in a country like Jordan, which hosts something like 750,000 refugees, about 10% of its total population. I mean, the equivalence of that would be if we were having 6 million refugees living in Britain uh, to be 10% of our population. So uh, these are people who've gone through a great deal of deprivation, of problems, of getting into the backs of refrigerated lorries, risking their lives, jumping on traffic. Uh, they have to be young and fit to do that. They are not, sadly, representative of the world's refugees, as I've just explained, but they are the ones who can actually make it under the guise, I'm afraid, of the traffickers uh, and the people who are making lots of money on this, the smugglers. Um, to get into small boats and risk the channel crossing, which after all, as you know, George, is the busiest waterway in the world. It's a very risky journey, even 
in uh, relatively clement weather, uh, as, as we both know. What sort of money are these traffickers picking up from these people, Keith? Well, it can be anything from five to ten thousand um, pounds. Payment to people from the country of origin. Uh, very often, uh, I mean, this is we, we we see this in more legitimate ways, in which, for example, Chinese families in the past have clubbed together to send one person over to the UK legitimately on a work permit to actually work and then send money back. And you will know again from your own worldwide experience that uh, enormous amount of money goes into the countries of origin by way of remittances. Uh, I mean, Poland was a very good example. The Polish workers that came over here were sending an enormous amount of money back home, and that stimulated the Polish economy. And there are parts of Bangladesh and Pakistan that I know which were really poor rural areas until their population started moving to Britain and sending back remittances. And now they've got all sorts of uh, good stores and hotels and things like that there. A lot of it funded through remittances. Now, uh, what about the dichotomy I made, Keith? Uh, it is, I mean, you and I both sat in Parliament. We both sat in surgeries. Uh, we both dealt with uh, people who were uh, claiming asylum, claiming to be refugees. Uh, most of them weren't. How do we resolve this issue of the well, confusion of refugees and migrants? Yes, well, that's very, it's a very good point. First of all, um, a, a lot of those young fit men will be adventurers. They, they won't be fleeing from persecution. They won't come within the strict definition of what constitutes a refugee under the 1951 convention, namely being in genuine fear of persecution, being outside their country of origin and being unable or unwilling to actually put themselves under the tutelage of their country of, of, of origin. So some of them won't uh, fit into that category. I have to say that whether it's uh, the, the nature of people seeking seeking refuge in this country or for some other reason, the, uh, there has been a massive improvement rate in the recognition of refugees. So actually, in, in your day, which you will remember, it was uh, about a quarter to a third of people who were being recognized as refugees once they claimed asylum. Uh, now it's over 50 percent, 55 percent or more. So that has actually improved. I mean, that shows that the profile is actually more genuine refugees, but what to do with the ones who are not. Now, uh, we've just as a country decided to come out of Europe, so we will no longer be able to avail ourselves of the Dublin Convention, which is the uh, inter-European agreement, uh, whereby if somebody claims asylum, asylum in one country and they've travelled through what's known as a safe third country, like France, which you were describing earlier, it's not a police state, um, then they can be return to that country and they have to make their asylum claim there. Well, now the French are going to be very able to say, well, I'm sorry, Dublin doesn't apply to you now. You're stuck with these people. Uh, and in fact, I think probably surreptitiously without casting aspersions on the French, uh, they may turn a bit of a blind, a blind eye to the fact that um, some of these people are trying to get out from France and coming to the, the UK. Uh, it's, it's for them good riddance, you know, they don't really want them. And one of the problems with France has been it's notoriously difficult to claim asylum in France. Uh, the, the, the people, the police, buzz them around the different departments and move them uh, to the border. They put them on a one-way ticket to Paris. They then come back to Songat, to northern France, and try again. Uh, it is very, very difficult to access the asylum process in France. Some might say cynically that that's rather deliberate. Um, but, you know, we're not like Australia. We haven't got an island like Nauru, where we can suddenly ship all the asylum seekers onto an island and process them there and keep a uh, regular control over them. At the moment, they're having to be put in uh, hotels which are not being occupied by tourists because of the pandemic, and they're having to be housed there in a comparatively free society. So it's not too difficult to just disappear into society. It's a big problem, but it can only be solved, George, 
by European cooperation. And this is where, sadly, although unlike you, I'm a very staunch pro-European, uh, uh, sadly, I'm afraid this is a big failure of Europe. It's been full of nimbyism. Not in my backyard. Every country has tried to put the burden onto the other countries, like the first line of communication, like Greece, Spain, France, uh, certainly Italy, coming through Lampedusa. Uh, we, we, we've shied away from taking responsibility. And it's about time that we were real about this. I mean, we take a tiny percentage of asylum seekers. I mean, we're, we take... Germany, for example, last year took something like... 23% of all the applications in Europe. That's 120,000 people. Spain took 115,000 claimants. Greece took 75,000 claimants. We took 35,000. It's disproportionate. Yeah, and the point I made earlier, I don't mean to tempt you onto foreign policy grounds, but given that Britain has played a leading role in the wars in, in Yugoslavia, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria and in Libya. It's a bit rich. The British, of all people, are seeking to avoid their responsibilities in this regard. Well, yes, we have agreed, uh, rather with our arm being twisted up behind our back, we've agreed to take 23,000 refugees, and that was uh, scheduled before this year. Well, so far we've only taken about 11,000, so I'm not sure when the others are coming. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the manifest failure of the West to try to sort out the unfolding tragedy in Syria meant that inevitably there was going to be a massive migration of people fleeing from genuine persecution. And nobody in their right mind can avoid looking at the television or listening to the radio and realizing that Syria is the most terrible place to be. I mean, I, I challenge anybody to say that somebody can sit in Syria and feel that they're not in fear of persecution or death. Uh, so, of course, it's generated massive migration. And as I referred to earlier, I mean, the, the the neighbouring countries like Jordan have taken a disproportionate uh, burden of that. I mean, you know, 750,000 refugees in camps. And I've been to Jordan. I've seen the camps in which they're placed. Yes, they're in the middle of the desert. Uh, yes, it's very difficult for people to get out from them and go into the towns or anything like that. So it's a different environment from the one in Britain, where if you're put into a hotel in Hull, uh, you can just walk out and uh, go straight into the, the streets and the, and the neighbor, neighborhood. Um, so it's different. But even so, uh, it, it is, we have not stepped up to the plate, I'm afraid, as a country to either encourage others or indeed to show leadership in taking, uh, frankly, a fair share of the, the tragedy of the world's refugees. Keith Best, a pleasure to talk to you again. Thanks for joining us, former Conservative MP, former Chief Executive of the Immigration Advisory service thanks for joining us uh, will you take the russian covid ma vaccine a yes 35 percent b no 52 percent c wait for the uk one 13 percent heavy polling on this one by the way uh so uh um either that means it's a particularly large audience tonight or people are circulating the poll uh we'll find out in due course which it is let me take a 60 second break Just like my game on the courses of Scotland, George. I'm coming out swinging. I'm in the rhythm of my life, and I'm sinking everything, George, on my way to turn two. My points have never been lower. The economy, my numbers speak for themselves. And if they could speak, they'd be like, you're doing such a great job, Mr. President, you're so sexy. I am shooting so under par right now, so under par. I'm just always playing great. It is me, Joe Biden. It sure is, Joe. Be a guy and get my ball out of that bunker. It is me, Joe Biden. You never catch me in one of those, America. Another thing you'll never catch me doing is listening to the mother of all talk shows, all talk shows in the Washington, D.C. area 
a 105.5 are the magic numbers there. Or anywhere else across America for that matter. I mean, what's left of it? Hashtag winning. It is me, Joe Biden. It is me, Joe Biden. God damn it, who would they let this guy run? Do they want me to be president? Radio Sputnik. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. The world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Now, Rain says, as a child, I only heard Margaret Thatcher referred to as bloody Margaret Thatcher by my dad and late grandpa. I still can't hear her name without automatically putting that in front of it, even now. Michael says, not taking a vaccine when hydroxychloroquine has been recommended by several doctors, George. The vaccine is a money spinner, nothing else. <laughs> Ricky says, watching your show right now, and I love you guys, because you're telling everyone about how things really are. Facebook says, Fraser, uh, on Facebook rather, Fraser says, as a 56-year-old, I will take a chance with the Russia vaccine. After all the other chances I've taken in my life, I'd be a bit of a wuss not to. And Pauline says, Britain needs immigrants. And Chris says, they work hard for their money. They should be able to do what they want with it. Sean says Trump is the best president the U.S. has had since Ronald Reagan, cleaning up the garbage left over by failed socialists. Who were they <laughs> since he was last in power? Who were the failed socialists? YouTube says, Mick says uh, they are fleeing bombs, not seeking handouts, as the posters say. Uh, a user says, having open borders and a welfare state is a bit like expecting the air conditioning system to work with all the windows open. It won't. And on Twitter, Everett says, let's discuss the root cause of these refugees, namely war, arms sales, propping up dictators, and instability that is sowed far too often by our own countries. I kind of think I did that, Everett. Uh, and uh, responses to the poll, Samson says, I have no reason to distrust, dis, distrust Russian pharma more than UK or US pharma, but it remains the case that Sputnik 5 hasn't undergone phase three trials powered to evaluate efficacy and safety. Not only this, but phase one and two data hasn't been published. We'll be asking Dr. Ranjit about this very subject. And on Facebook, Rene says, what was the cause of Trump's brother's death. Why keep it a secret? Was it COVID-19? I have no idea, Randy. Maybe it's just medical confidentiality. He's not a public figure, just because he's the brother of the president. Uh, Chris says, will you take the Russian vaccine, George? Chris, you're obviously late to the party. I've already spoken about that. Dave says, couldn't the pupils have continued with their work at home via the internet? and taking the exams under controlled systems. Michael says Britain should follow the Finnish school system. Well, we're nearly finished. Uh, Eduardo says education in this country, as in many, is just geared towards jobs and not real education or culture. It is just a business. And Anton says for years this has been going on. University boys who go on to rule by chance of birth. And on YouTube, Gavin says, don't blame the Tories, blame those who voted for them. And Dennis says, why do England and Wales have private exam boards? Two students can sit an exam in English set by different boards on different days and have different questions. How does that make sense? Now, that was the week. That was, this is where I try to make sense of today's world by telling you about what happened in the seven days in the past, going back a few centuries, <laughs> it was on this day in 1896 that gold was first discovered on a tributary on the Klondike River called Rabbit Creek. You can probably understand why they renamed it Bonanza Creek, the Klondike. In 1977, on this day, I know because it quite spoiled my birthday in 1977, the king died. That's Elvis Presley at his home, Graceland. Now for younger viewers and listeners, Elvis Presley 
was really something. Uh, he kind of grew into a caricature in the Vegas days. But if you look at the early Elvis, if you listen to uh, his work on Sun Records, for example, before he went to RCA, if you look on, at the video of the 1968 comeback special, you'll see the greatness of Elvis. He never came to Britain in his 42 years. That's all he lived. Apart from a short stopover at Prestwick Airport in Scotland when he was 25, coming back from Germany when he was in the US Army. When he stepped onto the tarmac, he said, where am I? To commemorate the visit, the airport named a bar after him. Well, business is business. He was only there a few minutes and the only thing he said was, where am I? But he's one of ours. Uh, on this day in 2012, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was granted political asylum by Ecuador and he holed up, as they say, in the embassy in London. And in 2008, Jamaican sprinter Usain Bolt set a new world record of 9.69 seconds to win the 100 meter gold medal at the Beijing 2008 Summer Olympics. What speed does uh, Kylian Mbappe run at? I have truly never seen a footballer who ran as fast as an Olympic sprinter, but I thought I did the other night. Anyway, today is also the birthday of the second most famous person to share the date. Madonna is 61 today. Now I have been linked with Madonna every year at this time uh, since she became famous, I was famous long before her, because we have the same uh, birthday, uh, because I became friends uh, with uh, some of her former husbands and more of her former lovers, Warren Beatty, Sean Penn, and Dennis Rodman, my friend, the basketball player, uh, were all uh, husbands and lovers of uh, Madonna. And about eight years ago, I was in Harrods shopping for a suit <coughs> when I heard a familiar voice say, hey, hi. And I looked over and saw an even more familiar face and it was indeed Madonna walking towards me. Now, I had never met her before. We had not been formally introduced, so I wouldn't normally have spoken to her. But she started talking to me and it became clear that she thought I was somebody else because she ran out of conversation quite quickly, having in the beginning indicated that this was an important conversation for her. It's my only actual physical encounter with Madonna. Uh, a day later, so that's the 17th of August, in 1945, President Sukarno and Mohammed Hatta declared Indonesia, formerly the Dutch East Indies, how absurd is that, independent from the Netherlands. My wife celebrates this. On the same day in the same year, Korea was divided into North and South Korea along the 38th parallel. And this week in 1979, Monty Python's Life of Brian has premiered. The Monica Lewinsky affair comes to a climax, sorry about that, in 1988 when US President Bill Clinton admitted that he had an improper physical relationship with the intern and that he misled people about the relationship. In other words, he had lied. Did I tell you the story about me and Monica Lewinsky? I'll tell you on another occasion. In 1940, on August the 18th, the Battle of Britain was at its height in the Second World War. The air battle, known as the Hardest Day, was being fought out over the skies of England's south coast. The Luftwaffe lost approximately 69 aircraft and the RAF 68 in one of the largest ever air battles. At this time in 1964, South Africa was banned from taking part in the 18th Olympic Games in Tokyo over its refusal to condemn apartheid. Well, it could hardly condemn it as it was practicing it. On the same day in 1969, three days and nights of sex, drugs and rock and roll came to a peaceful end as the Woodstock Music Festival wound down. 
The United States U-2 pilot Gary Powers was sentenced to 10 years in prison by a Soviet military court on August the 19th, 1960. And after eight years of war in 1988, Iran and Iraq began a ceasefire. On the 8th of August, as a matter of fact, 1988. Now here's a classical reference. In 1882, on August 20th, Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture debuted in Moscow. My goodness, that must have been a night. And in 1968, on the same day, it says here, Soviet and Warsaw Pact troops crossed the border into Czechoslovakia and put an end to what they called the Prague Spring. Two years later, in 1970, the England soccer captain, Bobby Moore, was cleared of charges of stealing in a trial in Colombia. I think it was a handbag, was it a handbag he was charged with stealing? Because shamefully, I've been in a Scottish football crowd that asked him about that handbag uh, loudly and often. The Duchess of York was again in the news in 1992 when a tabloid newspaper published a series of photographs of a Texan businessman, it'd have to be Texan, called John Bryan, sucking her toes. He later sold the story of his affair for a quarter of a million dollars. In 1993, the Oslo peace accords between Israel and Palestine were signed. That one didn't last. At least 1,700 people died after volcanic gases escaped from a lake in Cameroon. The gas from Lake Nios killed all living things within a 15 mile radius of the lake. And on August 21st in 1991, a right wing coup in the Soviet Union, who writes this stuff, was crushed by popular resistance led by President Boris Yeltsin. The roots of the Vietnam conflict began on August 22nd in 1945 when Ho Chi Minh led a successful revolution, it was, Ron. And finally on the same day in 1978, the Kenyan president and founding father Jomo Kenyatta died aged 89 at his home in Mombasa. Another tumultuous week then. That was the week that was. Rusty in West Wales is up on COVID in the USA. Sounds like a Blondie song. Rusty, go on. How are you doing, George? I'm good. Nice to hear from you. Yeah. A lot of respect for you, man. And Thanks, uh, God bless you on your new child and all that. Thank you, brother. Oh, you're welcome. Right. I'm just looking at figures, really, that came across from the CDC and the World Health Organization regarding the influenza and the subtypes. And they broke off at the end of the, in week 14, if you want to bear, bear me out right now. Um, and like, what I'm saying to you is, is that basically we've got a disparity here between the figures from the, um, God, uh, what's his name now? Uh, Fauci. And basically the number of people that have died lately, it's like in this last season anyway, since like week 40, if we like from last year, to this year, and if you overlay the influenza and um, pneumonia, I mean, we've got like 210,000, maybe 220,000 deaths, right, from influenza, okay? So, <clears throat> while I'm saying that, I'm just saying to you that, uh, like the last four years, we have... Uh, roughly around the same figure. I mean, remember just trying to average it out, but mm. I'll just say maybe 190,000 deaths. Right? Are you oh, talking please. about the US or about Britain now? The United States, yeah. yes. Yeah. Oh, the United yeah. States. Yeah. I mean, obviously... Because you, you, know, you know that, uh, that we were... Uh, we, we lost this year almost 70,000 people more than we lost as an average of the last five years. It's only in the last few weeks in Britain... Uh, that we are now back below uh, the five-year average. I understand that. Yeah, but, but the we're US talking not, about by, Yeah, the U.S. is a different kettle of fish. Go on. Uh, well, we're talking about subtypes as well, right? And they broke off reporting on this. Um, like I said, in I think it was week 
from like week 14 anyway. But the point is, that what I'm saying to you is that the deaths, right, for uh, pneumonia and influenza, right, are quite high and they both peaked, both COVID and um, influenza peaked at the same time. And what I'm saying to you is, is it really is a double whammy. And what we're going to get this for, I mean, it's going to be a hell of a ride, okay? Yeah, uh, indeed. I'll tell you what, Rusty, I'll ask uh, Dr. Ranjit to comment uh, on what you've said. I appreciate it very much. Uh, the United States is uh, in a very, very serious situation now uh, because they don't even have a health service, uh, as well as this rampant influenza, as you've described it, and the COVID on top of that. The United States is in a very, very bad place. Let's go to the United States, to Mass. It chews it, it's Mark. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Mark. Um, hi. Uh, hi. Hi, George. Hi. Um, glad to talk to you. And you. Um, yeah. Um, I'm a um, volunteer and a pledge director for, um, for draftjesse.com. Like, um, I'm just waiting for his official announcement so he can... Um, so he can actually make it official, but the movement to elect him and via a writing campaign presses on. And we are seeking electors right now, especially in Texas and Ohio. Texas is up tomorrow at 12 noon Texas local time. So, so we need electors to go to draftjesse.com to, to sign up and learn more, and I would appreciate it if you help. Um, well, uh, definitely, on Mark, uh, uh, to, to paraphrase Governor Ventura himself, there has never been a better time for an independent candidate to run for president when you've got a clown against a corpse and a highly dodgy uh, vice presidential candidate uh, now tied to the corpse. If I were Sleepy Joe, I'd be careful round about Kamala Harris. I would certainly wouldn't go up on the roof uh, to look at the stars with her. Uh, there's never been a better time, in, or a time in which it was more desperately needed to have an independent candidate uh, than now. And there's never been a better independent candidate available than Governor Jesse Ventura. So I strongly uh, endorse what you've said. Uh, give us the, uh, the internet address again. Um, okay, well, the website is draftjesse.com. Um, well, the actual URL is peopleforjesse.com, but Draft Jesse, if you type that down, that takes you right to the website, and it has a way that you can sign up to be an elector. And um, it's really hard to, to get in touch with Jesse because um, he likes living off the grid, so it's really hard to reach him. So we're trying to... Yeah, um, I mean, uh, if you want my honest yeah. opinion, uh, he's running out of time. Uh, but, there is oh, yeah. still, but there is still some time. And I hope that he's listening tonight and that he will heed and respond. Mark, thank you very much indeed for that. 60 seconds. I'll be right back. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for a regular segment called Criminal Injustice about the most egregious conduct of our courts and how justice is denied to so many people in this country. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Thursday and every Thursday for thorough and independent analysis of our criminal injustice system. Mikey, what's happening? Joey! The usual? Sure. You looking fresh, man. You get a new haircut? Nah, brother. I just got that, you know, scholarship from the College of Knowledge. Oh, you got into the University of the Airwaves? Sure did, brother. I got knowledge coming out of my ears. GG, man. He knows what's up. I knew there was something new about you. Yo, reckon he take me? Everyone is welcome, brother. Even from Jersey. 
<laughs> Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Global higher education, with one of the world's best-known iconoclasts. The mother of all talk shows, with George Galloway. Well, you've got about 15 minutes to vote in the poll. Will you take the Russian COVID vaccine? A, yes, 34. B, no, 52. C, wait for the UK one, 14. You can vote on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. Hassan says Mbappe's speed was recorded at 23.61 miles per hour. And that's with a ball at his feet, heading towards a goal, vaulting over the desperate challengers of defenders, and oftentimes smashing it into the back of the net. Andrew is in Devon. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Andrew. Oh, hello, George. Nice to hear from you. Uh, Yeah, happy birthday. Thank you, sir. Congratulations on a hat trick and congratulations on the birth of your sixth child. Thank you so much. God bless you. Uh, Thank you. I've been listening and watching Moats for years and I agree with you on 90% of the things you say. And I respect you very much, but I think you're way off about the vaccine called Sputnik V. Tell me. Uh, Well, firstly, it's not gone through a phase three clinical trial, which is, I think, incredibly important for public trust. They look into the side effects about vaccines and, and it could take years to show how, you know, to make sure that a vaccine is safe. Um, also, it doesn't really have, have been the same, th- Andrew, would that have been the same if Britain and America had developed it? Would yeah, we, oh, absolutely. Would, would, we not, would we not be using it for several years? Oh, absolutely. See, I think it's incredibly important. And also, it's nothing to do with Russia. It hasn't got anything to do with Putin as a leader. I wouldn't trust any po- uh, politician if they said it was safe. I mean, just because Putin said that it's safe means nothing. Okay, uh, but, but before we leave more. that point, Andrew, before we leave that sure. point, uh, it is true, isn't it, that if Britain and the United States or the United States or Germany had mm. developed the vaccine, they would mm. not have waited several years uh, before people were invited to take it, would they? Well, I would hope for, I would hope so. But I you mean, know, that's you how, may that's hope how so. Clinical trials work. But you 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 might hope so, but you know that wouldn't have been the case because well, do you? We, yes, because the the media narrative for all of this year, virtually, has been that mm-hmm. we'll be lucky if we get a vaccine by the end of the year. It'll more likely be uh, in early twenty one. They weren't saying. We'll get one at the end of 2020, but it'll be several years before we can use it. Mm. Okay, well, I, I understand that. But if, uh, if Trump or Boris said that they gave it to your daughter, I'm sure you'd be saying that was ridiculous. No, uh, I wouldn't. I, I trust the uh, Russian uh, no, I, I, I scientists trust, that have I, developed it's nothing this. about Russia. Yes, it's uh, nothing to do with Russia as a country or Putin, like I said. I also think that naming it Sputnik V was a mistake. Why? It turns the thing political. It's a global Heaven pandemic forfend. where 21... Heaven forfend. Oh, come on. It's a global pandemic where 21 million people have died. It's not a space race. It's not. 21 pe- million people have died. You can't just, you know, but that's my where opinion. Where are you getting that figure? 21 million people have died? Well, it's, that's exactly what it says for worldwide deaths of COVID-19, 21.5 million people. you sure about well, that? Also, do you, do you not find it, do you uh, not find uh, it disturbing Andrew, that Russia... Andrew, sorry, yes. Andrew, that, sorry mm-hmm. to put, as you've been so nice to me, that number is rubbish. There's, is there's, it? There's absolutely, there have been 770,000 people died of COVID, not 21 million. Okay. Anyway, it's been lovely talking to you, and I'll tell you what, I promise you, I'll put your points uh, to Dr. Ranjit later in the show. Now, oh, good- I do, I do apologise. Yeah, 21.5, 21.5 million people have been have had have had COVID-19. But just before you go, can I ask you one more thing? Yeah. Okay. So, does it not disturb you that Russia's top respiratory doctor, Professor Alexander Chicharlin, has quit the Russian Health Ministry citing gross violations and medical ethics concerning Sputnik V? I, I've never heard that. Uh, it would concern me, uh, if true. But as you 
just two minutes ago claimed 21 million people had died. You'll forgive me okay, if that I was, check. That was a You're, mistake. I'm yeah, just, I'm, I that know, was just a mistake. But, but I'm, I'm just making a point. You'll forgive me if I check that point uh, now that you have uh, made it. Thanks anyway. Uh, Goodwill is in Nuneaton. Go ahead, Goodwill. Hello, George. How are you? Uh, good. I'm enjoying the show. I hope you are. Yeah, yeah I am. So uh, I have a question here for you, George. Um, in light of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and in uh, discussing about the exam results, I think the Western society has had, to some degree, um, a discussion about white privilege, whether people believe it exists or it doesn't. Is it not time yet to have a, a proper discussion about class privilege and how and if there is or there isn't any systematic structures that are suppressing the poor people and elevating those who are born into uh, the upper class or the rich class or the elite class of the society. Is it not time yet to, for, for the Western society to have a discussion on that? Well, a uh, point brilliantly made. Uh, it's not just the elite, though. It's not just the, the, the 1%. It's not even just the 9%. B Britain is stratified into many different classes. And the whole algorithm uh, issue of the last week has proved that. You see, you're not elite if you're at a school in, I don't know, Surrey. It's a prosperous area. Uh, you're probably earning a fair bit more than the average wage, but that doesn't make you elite. You're middle class. And what we now know from Big Al Gorhythm is that elite schools, Big Al leaves them well alone, doesn't downgrade them at all. Middle class schools, Al downgrades them, but not so much. Working class schools, schools where poor people proliferate, Big Al has got it in for them. He scythes their, uh, their uh, grades uh, unrecognizably. Massive difference in the downgrading of working class children versus middle class children and even more extremely versus the children of the elite. So think back, Goodwill, to that great sketch with Peter Cook and Dudley Moore and John Cleese. There's a very tall man who looks down on the middle-sized man uh, because he's middle class. And there's the middle class man looks down on the smaller man with the cloth cap because he is working class. And it's even more stratified than that, but that will do for uh, the beginning of that discussion that you are looking for. Thanks for the call. Mike is in Nassau. How could I refuse a call from Nassau? Go ahead, Mike. Hi, George. How are you? I'm good. Nice to hear from you. Uh, I just want to know about, uh, you've heard obviously about the, the UAE normalizing um, relations with uh, Israel. Yes, of course. And I don't think they really got anything for it. I mean, for the Palestinians, they're still going to um, annex the West Bank. They just said they're going to delay it for a while. They didn't even give a say how long. They could do it tomorrow. Well, they, did, they, they didn't do it, Mike, for the Palestinians. That's just uh, window dressing and, uh, and not very convincing uh, window dressing. Uh, the UAE and other Arab countries have been uh, secretly sometimes not so secretly, uh, dancing with the Israelis for a very long time. Egypt and yeah. Jordan have already got full diplomatic relations. So what the UAE has done is not the first and not remotely the most important uh, of the abandonment of the Palestinian case by uh, Arab states uh, goes. Now, Somebody asked me on RT America, it was my good friend, 
Manila Chan, asked me the other day, uh, well, look, if we've known that they've been playing footsie under the table all this time, why is it such a big deal that they've now made it uh, official? And I answered this way, Mike. It's a bit like suspecting that your wife was having an affair with someone and then being forced to watch her walking yeah. down the street hand in hand with an engagement ring on uh, with her latest squeeze. That's what's broken the heart of the Palestinian people. Not that the UAE is particularly important in the, in the grand scheme of things. Not that they did not know that the UAE have been collaborating with Israel for a long time. It would be interesting uh, just how long. That's not yet established. But now that this relationship is public and their faces are being rubbed in it, it's very, very hard for them to bear. Yeah, I actually lived in the UAE for five years, ending October 2015, and I'm still on a rental property there. Um, I'm just very disappointed, and I think that will actually uh, unstabilize the whole uh, GCC, which hasn't been very stable lately at all. No, the, 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 G, the GCC is a profoundly unstable uh, collection of dictatorships, uh, royal uh, autocracies, uh, with uh, huge migrant populations, very small native populations, except for Saudi Arabia, whose native population is beginning to uh, revolt uh, because uh, the good things uh, that were available to previous generations of Saudi citizens are no longer uh, available. But Mike, I'm going to leave you because Omar is in the UAE. Better hear from him. Go ahead, Omar. Hello, Mr. Galloway. Welcome. Go it's, ahead. Uh, it's hard to agree with your analyses, but uh, on a separate issue, um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the UN Security Council ruling for the Iranian weapons embargo. Well, I didn't see the result, but I presume the American motion fell. It fell overwhelmingly. Um, America and uh, the Dominican Republic, with all respect to the Dominican Republic, not a all very due, all due respect. significant all due player. Respect. In all respect to which they are entitled. Of course. Not a particularly significant player in geopolitics. And then China and Russia strongly opposed, and 10 countries abstained. Uh, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on this. I mean, does that well, mean uh, that the uh, uh, The open? United States obviously knew that this resolution could not pass uh, because even if they had got a significant vote for it, uh, Russia and China would both have vetoed it. But the fact that they only got the Dominican Republic on their side uh, reduces the thing to farce. Uh, but uh, what will now happen is that the United States diplomats, if we can call them that, uh, will uh, try to move the argument on uh, to uh, the inspections, snap inspections, which the uh, Iran nuclear deal provided for if anyone felt that Iran was not fulfilling its obligations under the Iran nuclear deal. But the U.S. has already left the Iran nuclear deal, but wants to still be allowed to go and inspect, snap inspections in Iran, even though they have surrounded Iran with, uh, with weapons of war, have heaped sanctions after sanctions after sanctions on Iran, ripped up the nuclear deal, they still want to act as if they were in it and conduct <laughs> snap inspections in Iran. This is absurd. It's it nice is, to have your cake and eat it too. Well, yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, worse than that. It's, it's to have your cake, it's to leave the cafe. Uh, it's, I mean, it's absurd. It is ridiculous. But that's the position the United States is now in. And thank you for bringing me up to date uh, because I didn't hear the result of the vote. That was Omar in the UAE. Let's hear from Jamie Lowe and get the news headlines, shall we?
curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Tune in every Tuesday to Loud and Clear for a regular segment called False Profits, a weekly look at Wall Street and corporate capitalism, where we talk about the big economic issues of the week from the point of view of working people, the poor, and the U.S. position in the global economy. Join us this Tuesday and every Tuesday with financial policy analyst Daniel Sankey right here on Radio Sputnik. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money-related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. The British government and the exams regulator are being threatened with legal action as pressure mounts for a rethink over the awarding of A-level grades. Around 280,000 students saw their grades fall by one or more from their predicted results following the introduction of a new moderation algorithm, which was put in place after the coronavirus lockdown led to exams being cancelled. The majority of the students who were marked down were from poorer areas and the algorithm based its judgment on previous results from their schools. Education Secretary Gavin Williamson has been accused of abandoning his promise of a triple lock for students following the announcement of regulator Ofqual's criteria for using mock exams and appeals, although that has now been withdrawn. Earlier today, hundreds of students marched out of Parliament Square and headed to Williamson's department building. They were heard to shout, get Gav out and come out Gavin. In other news, Ireland has reported its largest daily number of new coronavirus cases since early May. It's announced 200 positive tests on Saturday in what the country's chief medical officer described as a deeply concerning development. There are multiple clusters and COVID-19 cases are rising in many parts of the country, Ronan Glynn said. The World Health Organization says 294,237 cases have been recorded worldwide in the last 24 hours and in total more than 21.4 million cases and over 771,000 deaths have been logged by the Johns Hopkins University. US President Donald Trump has paid tribute to his best friend and youngest brother following his death at 71. It's with a heavy heart I share that my wonderful brother Robert peacefully passed away tonight, he said in a statement on Saturday. The president had visited his brother in hospital in New York the day before his death, telling reporters he's having a hard time. It's unclear what caused Robert Trump's death, and he was the youngest of Fred and Mary Ann Trump's five children, and was born two years after his brother Donald. The new leader of the Scottish Conservatives has apologised for missing a VJ event to work as a linesman at a football match. Douglas Ross said he was wrong to officiate at the Scottish Premiership game between Kilmarnock and St Johnston, rather than attend a two-minute silence in his Moray constituency. It sparked criticism from opponents, including Labour MSP Neil Finlay. He said that the decision shows his appalling judgment and, quite frankly, his arrogance too. The apology comes less than two weeks after Ross was confirmed as the leader of the Scottish Conservatives following the resignation of Jackson Carlaw. Tens of thousands of opponents of Belarusian president President Alexander Lukashenko have gathered in Minsk to protest against disputed elections. The March for Freedom in the centre of the capital came amid growing anger over alleged poll rigging and police violence at subsequent protests. In an address to a smaller crowd of several thousand, Lukashenko blasted opponents as rats. He called on supporters to defend their country and independence. The rival rallies were taking place after Russia agreed to offer security assistance in case of external military threats to Belarus. It emerged that Lukashenko had twice spoken to President Vladimir Putin over the weekend. A female swimmer has broken the men's record for the number of cross-channel crossings and been assured her fears of falling foul of the UK-France quarantine rules are unfounded. Australian Chloe McArdle took 10 hours and 40 minutes to complete her 35th channel crossing after setting off from Kent on Saturday evening. 
She was worried that arriving in Calais would require her to self-isolate, but she said UK and French Coast Guards have given her the all clear. The 35-year-old started her 21-mile swim from Abbott's Cliff Beach near Folkestone at 8pm on Saturday and arrived in France just before 7am. And finally, the US Pentagon is forming a new task force to investigate sightings of alleged UFOs that have been observed by US military aircraft. The new unit is expected to be officially unveiled in the next few days. Members of Congress and Pentagon officials have long expressed concerns about the appearance of unidentified aircraft that have flown over US military bases, posing a risk to military jets. There is no consensus on their origin, with some believing they may be drones potentially operated by earthly adversaries seeking to gather intelligence rather than extraterrestrials. Florida Senator Mark Rubio told the Miami radio station, we have things flying over our military bases and places where we are conducting military exercises and we don't know what it is and it isn't ours, so that's a legitimate question to ask. Videos released by the Pentagon appear to show unidentified flying objects rapidly moving while recorded by infrared cameras. Two of the videos contain service members reacting in awe at how quickly the objects are moving. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. Dr. Ranjit coming up. The doctor will see you shortly. Uh, but some social media comments. Catherine says, I would have the vaccine as I have a vulnerable child and I trust the Russians more than I trust our current government. And on YouTube, Mick says, Madonna did exactly the same with me and Asda, George. That's brilliant. That's the... Uh, Message of the night. And Tom says, is Ghislaine dead yet? What's going on? And Hadidi says, the so-called COVID-19 is a fake. He had to write that with some difficulty because he had his straight jacket on. Des says, I want a shot of what Andrew from Devon has been drinking. And Joanne says, I heard that Wall Street is not happy about the vaccine because once the COVID-19 crisis is over, the benefits to the unemployed will stop, but there won't be enough jobs and the bubble will burst. And on Twitter, Guile says, I do natural immunity as vaccines are not safe yet. Corrupt science are skipping safety tests, which will take more time. The vaccine should not be rushed. Safety is priority. Stephanie says, the UAE has been collaborating with Israel for 50 years already. So the peace deal came as no surprise. And Pauline says it's 777,000 deaths worldwide if you choose to believe what they say. It's always a they, isn't it? Uh, Boris makes rules, says Margaret, like compulsory masks in shops, which are useless as they are not enforced. So I am still confined to my home. What's the point of making laws that people ignore? And by email, Attila says, France processed over... 120,000 asylum claims last year. Britain, around 44,000. Germany, around 165,000. It's a joke for your guests to suggest that they are trying to offload them onto the UK. I don't think Keith Best was suggesting that. He was uh, suggesting that as we are about to leave the Dublin Protocol, uh, perhaps uh, some French officials at the border uh, are uh, turning a blind eye and thus uh, an increase, a spike, you might call it, in dinghy traffic across the channel. Ah, pole two. Ah, what would you get me for my birthday? A, a new hat. What's wrong with the hat I've got? B, a Galloway tartan kilt. C, a Bob Dylan tattoo. Intriguing. You can vote now on my Twitter feed at George. Galloway. Now, Dr. Ranjit Brar, Moats Medic, uh, is the doctor. He is the man that has guided us through uh, the many months now of this catastrophe. 777,000 dead people, 21 million infected people. 
and of course an economy uh, that now sits in ruins. Couldn't get much more serious uh, than that. So let's hear from Dr. Ranjit. Doctor, thank you very much for joining us again. We, we must start uh, with the Russian vaccine. Uh, you probably saw our poll. Most people would not take it. I would take it. The president's daughter's taken it. A lot of criticism has been forthcoming tonight about the efficacy of the vaccine, the timing of it. Where do you stand on it? Thanks, George. Pleasure to be back with you again. And uh, happy birthday, can I just say in passing. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's, it's inevitably the case that there's going to be an intense uh, political speculation as well as scientific speculation around the virus. We said from the very beginning that the world of the coronavirus vaccine is so big, the world of the coronavirus rather is so big that it forces, uh, you know, scientific, medical, political, economic uh, interests all to uh, coincide, coalesce, and therefore every comment, every event um, has layers of speculation and layers of interested parties who comment upon it. From the beginning, George, we've seen um, the ridiculing, really, of the scientific uh, initiatives uh, and achievements of other countries outside, particularly um, Europe Amer and America, being, being ridiculed. Notably, you know, China's uh, uh, prescription public health prescriptions right from the beginning, right from the inception, have been brilliantly prescient uh, and clear. And if we'd followed those, uh, we wouldn't be in desperate need of the vaccine because we may have been able to achieve what the, uh, you know, the independent uh, sage is, is pressing for, which is zero COVID through public health measures. And China were very clear on that, but they were also advanced in their research. And that reflects the fact that China is a rising scientific and economic power who have the largest number of academic peer reviewed publications uh, in the world annually, um, more than the United States. China, of course, pulled itself up by its bootstraps from a very low start, pulled itself liquid, literally from backwardness and obscurantism as late as, um, you know, the, the 1940s and 50s. But Russia, of course, was also steeped in backward, backwardness and obscurantism under the czars and had its own revolutionary process through which it became a great um, superpower, not just in terms of its military, but in terms of its knowledge in terms of its science. There was a real renaissance of human culture and civilization that happened there in the 20s, 30s and 40s, which is the reason that Russia was the country that defeated fascism. The Gamaleya Institute itself um, has its uh, you know, roots in that phenomenon. And while Russia has been through a tumultuous time with the counter-revolution, it's been the one place on earth where the um, life expectancy has dropped by eight years following the counter-revolution in the 90s, those institutions have continued and Russia still has, you know, a, a tremendous scientific establishment and tradition. And that I think is worth saying as background just because there's so much uh, kind of a, a, a scorn has been pour, poured um, on the development of the Sputnik V vaccine. Now, look, I don't have uh, information that other people don't have. So sp in, in the world, there are many people who are striving to achieve a vaccine. And I maintain that a vaccine does represent a way out for a world which has failed to control the vaccine by the public health measures which could control the vaccine. That being the case, there are perhaps 190 groups who are looking to find a vaccine around the world. Um, only about 40 of those are at the stage of clinical trials and the WHO has a registry of those and this was one of them. It was listed as a, a phase one trial and there were only three or four, maybe five, which had reached the stage of phase three trials trying to um, increase the number uh, of people uh, that they were giving the vaccine to having proved efficacy um, uh, and safety. Now, essentially the Gamaleya Institute have said that they have been uh, uh, pursuing their trial, that they are happy to say that they've achieved. And again, I don't have all the data because it's not been widely published, which is why there's been criticism and they've been open to criticism. However, they say they've achieved efficacy uh, and they've achieved safety. And essentially they are changing their regulations so that they roll it out on a much larger scale at the same time as, as conducting post uh, uh, approval trials. So in a sense, they're, they're con they, they are rolling out the vaccine whilst continuing to monitor it, continue to see its efficacy and safety profile. Uh, that will give them the opportunity, if they find uh, an unexpected result, to withdraw it. But it's quite clear that 
They have a tremendous confidence uh, in their finding. Alexander Ginzburg, who was the director of the Institute, has taken it himself. He's in the 60s. Obviously, you know, President Putin has um, said one of his daughters has taken it very well. Uh, they have said that they're achieving uh, high levels of antibody response. And really, you know, we can't ask for more than that other than published data, which we don't have access to. Um, in terms of our own trials, the ones that we know about, there are perhaps three trials in China. Um, the, China the, the Sinovac seems to be the most advanced, but also the, there's the People's Liberation Army uh, Medical Institute uh, have a vaccine trial. Uh, and there's one, one more, which is the Beijing Institute of, of Biotechnology. Then, of course, the ones which are mostly dominant in our press are the AstraZeneca and the BioNTech uh, vaccine. So that the United States and, and the uh, British, uh, British uh, 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 vaccine. Now, our own vaccines have been steeped in controversy. I don't know if you're aware that um, uh, the director of the Jenner Institute in Oxford, uh, who's Adrian Hill, has been in an ethical controversy with Sarah Gilbert, uh, who has been in charge of the, well, she's a professor of vaccinology and been in charge of this program. They themselves have been running into problems and are having difficulty developing their vaccine precisely because actually now numbers are relatively low in Britain. So that the trial participants that they gave, that administered the vaccine to, it was several thousands, um, uh, are unlikely uh, to get the vaccine, to, to encounter the virus overall. And therefore it's hard for them to say whether they can prove efficacy in their large phase three trial. Russia, of course, has had very large numbers. Russia has had, is the, perhaps the fourth or fifth most affected country in the world, has 900,000 cases, and therefore that obviously is an environment in which that will facilitate their, t their testing. It also means that it's imperative for them. In, in, a state, in a way, it's a national emergency for them, George, and they have been mobilized quite clearly. Their military, and this institute is uh, an academic institute related to their military, has been charged with coming up with finding a solution. So clearly they're under pressure to perform, but they have tremendous experience. We know that this institute was instrumental in finding um, a, a, a successful vaccination for Ebola, for example. So the institute comes from a prestigious scientific background. They have a, a, a large um, repository of knowledge and development of vaccines. They have recently developed one for Ebola. Uh, the vaccine that they've uh, said they developed is an uh, adenovirus, a similar, in fact, to the, um, the, the vaccine that we think AstraZeneca are likely to market. And of course, people are right to be concerned about um, the safety profile of medicines that are put out. There have been numerous examples of Western pharmaceutical companies which have flouted that both in prescribing practices and in development practices. And there's a routine pressure, which is a profit making pressure, generally speaking, which leads to uh, you know, poorly conducted trials in terms of ethics. Uh, which leads to poorly marketed trials, which, le which leads to um, medicines being pushed when they're uh, in in uh, inefficacious for certain conditions, when their safety profile is poor. That is something we associate with the profit motive conflicting with the medical motive. That is not the pressure that the Russians are currently under. The Russians are under, you know, and the Institute, uh, uh, the Gamaleya Institute, are under a lot of pressure to help their people. And so, you know, they do want to advance the vaccine. I think that they will basically expand it whilst continuing testing and seeing this safety profile. I'm optimistic. I, I, I greet this as very good news. But of course, the situation will unfold and more information will come to light, George. Is there a controversy inside Russia about it? A young man earlier uh, told me that uh, a very high ranking figure, I forget his title now, uh, but a very high-ranking figure in the medical field in Russia had resigned from a prestigious position in protest at uh, the rushing uh, of this vaccine. Well, I did see that that was reported in a couple of papers, including, I think, the Daily Mail yesterday. I don't have a lot of information about it. But yes, clearly there's a pressured situation in, in face of a health pandemic to try and produce results. That's the case across the board. I think everyone is surprised that this tr trial has leapfrogged forward. Quite clearly, the Institute are very confident in the vaccine they have. Time will tell, George. Yeah. Everyone will know whether or not this has been successful. It's not something that they can hide and brush under the carpet if there are poor results. It's quite clearly that they therefore have an incredible degree of confidence in their product and they are keen to get on and 
if it's useful, to use it to help them get on top of what's a very difficult public health situation for Russia and for the world. Many, many countries have, have asked for um, orders in advance. And of course, you know, uh, they, they pledged to provide it on a public good basis. Um, that includes the Philippines, that includes India, ma ma many places. But yes, there's a d healthy degree of academic skepticism, but there's an unhealthy degree of political criticism from political adversaries, mm. and we just need to be balanced in the way that we interpret that. But yes. Well, uh, uh, speaking of that, Doctor, and of the Daily Mail, I see in the Mail on Sunday today that an old friend of mine, I haven't seen him a long time, uh, Seamus Milne, who was Jeremy Corbyn's chief uh, communications director, the allegation that it was Seamus Milne who gave the Prime Minister and Dominic Cummings, both of them, uh, the coronavirus, acting, uh, I suppose, as a kind of biological weapon. Uh, they called him a Marxist, and he had given the Prime Minister of Britain. Uh, have you, I don't suppose you know anything about that. I mean, the, the, the propaganda is very familiar, isn't it? But I mean, the, the concept that you can blame the person who gives you a virus for giving you the virus is a false one. I mean, it's very similar to the propaganda that we've seen from Trump about this being a communist virus, the CCCP virus and all the rest of it, when it's becoming increasingly clear that probably didn't originate in China in any event. China simply had the advanced science to identify it, um, genetically uh, characterize it and share that information with the world. And that will become increasingly clear. But this is a, a very typical reaction. Many, many people in government caught the coronavirus. It, you know, this was at a time when they were saying quite clearly and openly herd immunity was the way forward. We let it run through the population until people were pointing out you don't have to do, you have to do the back of a cigarette packet calculation. Not that I smoke <laughs> or you do, but, you know, back of a fag packet calculation. It was quite clear to see if that was the case. Clearly, between half a million and a million Britons could be expected to pass away if you just let it run through the population. They back down from their position, but they've never, the country as a whole has suffered. And it is interesting to note as a result that, as you have pointed out, and I've seen some of your material during the week, you know, Britain has been called out as having the worst results, the worst rate per million population. We've been saying for a long time, George, if you look at the actual uh, uh, excess mortality rate, uh, it's been quoted as till March in many publications as 64,000. But if you look at it overall, it's probably 78 or 80,000. That means that they're quoting, even in uh, you know the New Statesman, they've been quoting rates of, I think, 955, I can't quite see the figures, 955,000 deaths. So 955 deaths per million of the population. But really, it's in excess of 1,000 deaths uh, per million of the population, which makes Britain the worst affected country by coronavirus. We've had the worst economic performance with uh, a, a, a quarterly uh, decrease in economic contraction of economic size by 20% and predicted 11 or 12% for the entire year. Those are predicted they could be worse. So, you know, we've been doing incredibly poorly um, economic. Have, that's why our prime minister has gone on holiday. Don't you see? He needs it. He deserves it. Dr. Ranji, thank you very much indeed for joining us as always. Let's get on with some calls because the switchboard is red hot. Brian is in Glasgow. Brian, go ahead, sir. Uh, no, good evening, George. <clears throat> George, I'm always a bit concerned about anybody that deviates from this, uh, what may be seen as a responsible public health regarding COVID-19. Yeah. I'm looking at this regarding certain key markers of a general attitude towards something that is definitely out there. But in terms of mortality, and as you are talking about how it's caused this calamity in the economy, I would say it's not the COVID-19 that's caused the calamity. It is the response. And we have morbidities from other issues that have killed far more. Now, obviously, this is added to the total death rate. But again, we're still being asked to do things which scientifically are uh, totally wrong as far as cutting any uh, continuation of the, the, this disease spreading. Uh, it is partly now zoonotic three or four times. Uh, we're told it's not a flu. Uh, we're basically told nothing, but just basically... Told nothing? We're told. speaking about nothing else, Brian. What do you mean, told well, that's nothing? Jobs, there's, there's nothing. For example, this new virus. What is the adjutants in this new virus? The adjutants themselves are partly what's been the problem with viruses, given them the bad names. And if a virus in itself 
uh, creates a new normal, surely a bad adjutant into the general population's DNA, injected not via the body's DNA checks through the lungs, but directly through the skin. And there's too many, too many players who can use this as a front for lots of things, like an elite who can't run an economy other than suit themselves, crashing once again. Why would, the elite, why would the elite want to uh, reduce the economy by 20%, kill 771,000 potential customers and make 21 million potential customers sick? Why would the elite want to do that, Brian? I would think because of creative destruction, but more importantly... What's creative George, destruction? Tell me. Well, it, it, it seems more profitable to destroy than to build up the population. Tell me, tell me where the, where's, where's the profit in what I just said? Well, for example, when, why are we still doing more wars than we're doing... Uh, uh, no, don't, uh, change don't change the no, subject. That, no, no. Don't change the subject, Brian. No, no. Don't change the subject about wars. You said creative destruction. I'm yes. asking you to define it. Uh, well, I'm just saying that they will do things and plan them that will cause harm, but for them that is profitable. But, that is uh, well, exactly, destruction. exactly. So give me an example in, in this case of who, well, in this who, case, who profits from the economic and the public health devastation of the coronavirus. Who has profited? The banking elite. The banking elite How for has one. the banking elite profited from it? The banking elite, as they always do, destroy an economy, then buy it back at pennies on the dollars, whether it be a war, a disease, or anything else, George. So that goes right back to Reuters. So, Reuters news so, under. So China and Russia and Vietnam have been acting according to the diktat of the banking elite, have they? Again, George, I think it'd be naive to think that the banking elite would come right out and tell everybody what their plan is. They would more likely use their vast empire, their vast financing now, uh, to compartmentalise what they want, such as what, this what, health what, idea that covid nineteen's understood when adjutants himself might be some of the legacies that are now what, rooting the, the, your, the benefit of. What's your main problem with the banking elite, Brian? I, I never say that the banking elite is a manifestation a part of the problem, is it not? We've got one half scheming for socialism. Who are, who, half, who are the banking elite? George, the many are banking elite. What about the World Economic Forum? Are they the banking elite? I would no, say so. No. Who owns the banks, Brian? Who knows, George? Who, that's, that's a very good no, question. No, no, parliament say, what, the what, do you, what do you mean, who knows? It's a matter of public record who owns the banks. No. Well, then, the George, shareholders of the banks, financing this. The shareholders of the banks are all listed on the stock exchange, on the company's accounts. It's not a question of who knows, Brian. Everybody knows. Anybody that wants to know can know who owns the banks. You see, I suspect that you don't think uh, that everybody knows who owns the banks. I suspect that you think in your mind that a group of people own the banks and they're your enemies. And I'm trying to get you to admit that. What, what do you think? Admit, are you talking about a, a Jewish conspiracy here, bankers? Now, when I when I say bankers, George, I give not a twit who says what they are and go by their actions. And for anybody to say but that you, the economy you, you is said run, nobody knows who owns me, the George, banks. I'm answering your question. You, no, you, uh, no, Brian, you said nobody knows who owns the banks. But George, everybody knows. Again, th anybody right. knows so, who so, owns so, the banks. Right, so then what, what, are we going to move on from that then? So well, we know no, who the banks are. See, when, Why when are we people, not investigating because, financial instruments of £100 trillion? Pounds? Well, we know when, forensically. When people, so where is all that because money? Because when people talk to me about banking elites, it rings a big alarm bell for me, Brian. Well, that's I'm, your prejudice, George. Yeah, yeah, because, your prejudice yeah, is no, getting in the way not, of analytical no, analysis no, of international criminal activity. I know you're a great activity. scientist and a great analyst and much better than me. I left school at 16. But I've been around a long time. And I've been taking phone calls from people for a long time. And when people start talking about banking elites and that nobody knows who owns the banks, that big alarm rings for me. Good night. Good night, Brian in Glasgow. What would you get me for my birthday? A new hat, 42%. Is there something wrong with my hat? Why did you even think of that?
A Galloway tartan kilt, 19%. Do you know, I have never in my entire puff ever worn a kilt. I'm not sure if I ever will. Never say never. But a Galloway tartan is a very nice tartan. That's 19%. And a Bob Dylan tattoo at 39%. I don't believe in tattoos, uh, but if I did get a tattoo, a Bob Dylan tattoo, a cool one, uh, would, be, um, would be at least on my short list. Let me take a quick break. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for a regular segment called Criminal Injustice about the most egregious conduct of our courts and how justice is denied to so many people in this country. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Thursday and every Thursday for thorough and independent analysis of our criminal injustice system. The giant Labour Party sailing clearance is now on. Hurry now, as we've got zero interest in our party. It's literally the lowest it's ever been. Give up on the common man and save today. That's right, we're getting rid of all of the Corbynites. Literally every single one. Being a Blairite has never been more in style. Only available at what should be the UK's biggest political party. The new, new Labour Party. We're doing this again. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. Now, James asks, have you got any tattoos already, George? No, I don't believe in tattoos. Uh, I think they're wrong. Uh... But if I was going to get one, I might get a Bob Dylan one. Mary says, get forever young as a tattoo. Certainly one of my favorite songs, Mary, thanks. Georgie says, your hat is superb. You've likely already got a Galloway tartan bit. You love Bob Dylan, so a tattoo for you. And Maz says, maybe get some earplugs as there's a new baby in the house. I must say the new baby is uh, so peaceful and quiet. You'd hardly know that she was there. She wakes up just twice uh, during the night, which uh, compared to some of my other children is uh, pretty good actually. And on Twitter, Paul says, many companies are using COVID as a smoke screen to slash jobs and wages and delay opening places of work, thereby forcing people to continue working at home in unsatisfactory conditions, capitalism at its worst. And Lewis says, we want a story from Norma, don't we all? Lewis, she's coming up later, the legend that is Norman Bristol. Let's take a call from uh, Rashid or Gavin. Gavin in Belfast. Let's go to Belfast. Go ahead, Gav. Hello, George. I'm just calling just to, to, to make a, a wee inquiry here. I would just like to know if you could help me out and tell me where Cyril Ramaphosa uh, got all his money from. <laughs> I wish I could. I knew comrade Cyril Ramaphosa when he didn't have any money. Uh, yeah. And I mean uh, no money. Um, uh, he was a miners leader. Uh, then he was an ANC leader. And now he's a multi-millionaire uh, president of South Africa. I wish I knew the answer to that question. Uh, but I, uh, I don't. I... I may have told you the story before, Gavin, when uh, I was in the UAE trying to raise uh, uh, investment for uh, the film on Tony Blair that I uh, eventually made. And uh, the, one of the princes, one of the senior princes, invited me to lunch. He said, an old friend of yours is going to be there. So when I went in, uh, there was my old friend, Tokyo Sexuale, who uh, I had first known as a, a communist and a fighter for the African National Congress. And I, I assumed he was there on ANC government business. And I said, are you, are you he, what ministry are you now? Where, why are you here? He said, no, I'm the prince's business partner. 
uh, and uh, the people that were, there was a conference going on with hundreds of people, said, These, this is our middle managers. So God knows how big the company was. Now, how did Tokyo Sexuality get into a company with one of the senior princes of the UAE? How did comrade Cyril Ramaphosa become a multimillionaire? I wish I could answer those questions, Gavin, but I'd be lying if I said I knew uh, that it was all above board. You there, Gav? Yes, yes. Well, one of one of his biggest uh, one of his biggest businesses at the minute, George, is South African McDonald's. Believe it or not, it's a big investment. South African McDonald's. Nice work if you can get it. <laughs> Has he not got enough work to do running running uh, South Africa? Well, as you say, he was involved in the, in, the, in uh, miners' rights, and he was involved. I think he was something to do with the mine that shot the shot the miners dead. It was about thirty two or thirty three miners shot dead, and he was he had some sort of ownership or something to the mine with that happening. So uh, it's a disappointing uh, it's a disappointing set of circumstances, Gavin. I I don't like to dwell on it. It makes me sad. Thanks uh, very yeah. much uh, for the call. Uh, Rashid is in Long Beach in California. I wish I was. Go ahead, Rashid. Uh, George, thank you for the time. Uh, okay. I know you're a good, a big fan of football. Yeah. And I, I was wondering what your opinions were on the prolonged and finally uh, uh, failed effort to sell Newcastle United to the consortium of Saudi Arabia uh, Foundation and Amanda Stavely and the Rubin Brothers. As a as a dedicated Newcastle United football fan, the 13, 14 years of Mr. Mike Ashley's run has been uh, personally devastating, but compared to all the other crises going around the world, kind of insignificant, but still it hurts. And I'm wondering what your thoughts on that uh, process of uh, war in, uh, beyond the Premier League's decision to drag it out. And mm -hmm. is there a mad conspiracy of the major uh, clubs to prevent additional competition? Uh, well, it's a very good question uh, and uh, deserves more of an answer than I'm going to be able in the time available uh, to give it. Uh, first of all, uh, I too have a real soft spot for Newcastle United and an even softer spot for the people of Newcastle and always have had. I think they've got the coolest strip and the coolest training gear uh, in the league. Uh, I have been happy that they've had a slightly better season uh, than I feared that they might. I feared that they might be relegation candidates this year, but they were not. Um, I want uh, Newcastle to be taken over by uh, new owners that have the money to, uh, to build the club and to make it as big and successful as uh, a one club city like Newcastle should be. You've got a marvellous crowd, totally dedicated, a big travelling support, a very voluble one. Uh, what's not to love? I want that. Uh, but I don't want it at any price, Rashid. Uh, there would have been blood on the grass at St. James's Park if, uh, if the Saudi uh, dictatorship had been allowed to take it over. And as you rightly said there, or inferred, implied, uh, football's important, but it's not the most important thing. And a friend of mine was literally chopped to pieces by the Saudi royal dictatorship. I mean, literally, piece by piece, fed into a dream. And Jamal Khashoggi was only the best known of the people that have been murdered and tortured uh, by the Saudi regime. So I could not have been happy about such a regime buying Newcastle United. Uh, it would have been impossible for me to continue to have good feelings about them if uh, that had turned out uh, to be the case. Now, I'm well aware uh, that all kinds of rum individuals own football clubs. Sheffield United is now wholly owned uh, by a member of the Saudi royal family and no one pays it any mind. And my efforts to generate interest in it fell on stony ground. Manchester City's owners uh, don't bear 
uh, much examination. Uh, Manchester United's owners uh, don't bear a lot of examination. So I'm well aware, and Sevilla have just gone two one up, and I'm broken hearted to hear that noise in my ear. Now, my point, I think, Rashid, is that Saints don't generally succeed in owning and running uh, football teams. Uh, but I hope now that the Saudi deal has fallen through, uh, that uh, at least a slightly less bad group uh, of individuals will come to own Newcastle. Last word to you. The question I have for you, George, and I understand where you're coming from, um, is the Premier League's uh, really almost duplicitous uh, uneven approach to it. If they had the courage, if they had the cojones to come up and say what you just said, then we'd have a debate and we could argue about whether it's right or wrong. But just to drag it out and then to you know, let it go until it, it fades away in the news cycle is really nothing that a major corporation, a major institution is expected to do. And I have no respect for them in that. And I tend to still fall towards the conspiracy side of the major clubs doing their part to stop that kind of growth ex expansion. But you think I that, hope in the you future. Th you think that, that they did this because they didn't want Newcastle to be more successful competing for trophies and so on? I just think they don't want to carve the pie up that much. They're, they want See, to I keep a bigger that. chunk for themselves. I, I doubt that, Rashid. It would be in the interests of all the other owners uh, for another big club uh, to be generating uh, more success and more uh, bigger crowds, bigger sales. It would build the game up uh, in, in the Premiership. Whereas in Germany, everybody hates... RB Leipzig uh, because they're owned by a, a caffeinated drinks company. All the while, all these other teams are wearing gambling uh, adverts on their, on their chests. What's worse, gambling or caffeinated drinks? Well, I guess if you drink enough the caffeinated, you're gambling with your life. But, that is uh, a very good answer. That is a very good answer. Thanks for the call, Rashid. Mike is in South Carolina. Let's hear from him. Hello, George. It's great to talk to you again. I never miss your show. Happy Thanks. birthday. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, uh, even, if I, even if I have an emergency on Sunday and I can't listen to the show live, I always go back and listen to a rebroadcast. But Thank you. you and I uh, actually share this. You and I share this birthday week. My birthday is on Tuesday. Okay. Happy birthday <laughs> um, when it comes. Yeah. I'm two, I'm two years your senior, so... <laughs> we're both, uh, was, we're uh, both still uh, here. That's the, in, the important thing. Uh, that's right. That is the important thing. But uh, in, in 1957, when Sputnik was launched, I was a, uh, uh, a son of a, uh, a military officer, and we were living in uh, Madrid, Spain. And uh, uh, I remember, uh, like it was yesterday, going to the roof of our apartment in, uh, in downtown Madrid and sitting there and watching that spot of light move across the wow. sky that was Sputnik. Wow. It was insane. I mean, it was, it's, it's amazing, you know, that, you know, that, that I have that memory uh, yeah. of being there doing that. And the, uh, and now we have the uh, Sputnik five, the vaccine for the COVID virus. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a really, really uh, interesting time. I hope that all of the stories are true. Uh, I have a few reservations about it, it that I would like to mention. And that is, I don't know how anybody can say that this vaccine will give you two years of protection where it's only been around for a very, very short time. Yeah, and and most of the point, companies yeah. that, are, that are, yeah, most of the companies that are involved in making the vaccines tell you they don't know how long it will last, but they hope it will give you some, you know, some immunity for, you know, some time anyway. But, but here's the thing. The American companies, you don't have to worry about them and, and their financial woes because they've already been paid. I mean, I mean, you know, the government, uh, Trump and these people have already given them billions and billions of dollars in advance, uh, you know, for, for you know, 100 million uh, you know, doses of vaccine that are not even produced. It's so, a bit yeah, of a gamble, no, that one, isn't it? Yeah, but you don't have to worry about that because, the, you know, these companies that make these vaccines have already been paid. I mean, they have the money in the bank. Uh, uh, it's already nice been work. To them. Nice work so, if you can get it, yeah? Yeah, I understand, but but that's the way it works here. You know that yeah. is that is just the way it works here. No payment by results. I mean, there. Make sure these, 
Well, look, Mike, uh, Mike uh, thanks, uh, as always. Uh, brilliant call. Thank you very much. And you conjured up that memory of Sputnik in 57 so beautifully. It really touched me. Uh, let's go to Chris in Switzerland. He's not happy with me. Let's hear why. Go ahead, Chris. Ah, he's just disappeared. He wasn't that unhappy with me. Perhaps he, perhaps he, thought, perhaps he thought better of it. Uh, Ken says the flu vaccine has been around for over 50 years and we still have winter flu outbreaks with massive death tolls, yet no masks. Oh dear. And until recently, Anne says, until recently, I was working in a nursing home here in the States when we had a flu outbreak from January through March of 2019. 12 weeks, we lost two people to flu. In the, mid, in the eight weeks of our in-house COVID outbreak, mid-April to mid-June, we lost 30 people, almost one third of our residents. I'm extremely tired of the public's confusion of the mildly symptomatic younger survivors of COVID with annual influenza outbreaks. You and me both, Anne. Uh, let's go to Sarkar in Glasgow. He's always worth hearing. Sarkar, go ahead. Good work as usual. Uh, George, small question, basically. You know the American elections are literally in the next few months. Right now, the opinion polls may be showing, you know, Biden still leading Trump by a good margin. Yeah. But often I've been seeing Joe Biden making a total mockery of himself. A few weeks ago, he said this comment about, you know, Latin American being more inclusive than the black Americans. And right now, the debates have not even started. And if, when the debates would start between Trump and Biden, when Trump digs up his history about his son getting, you know, working in a Ukrainian, uh, you know, oil company or something. What if there are no the, debates, though, Saka? Sorry, what were you saying, sir? What, what if there are no debates? What if Joe Biden says, with the coronavirus and all, uh, I don't want a debate? After all, he's leading in the polls and he doesn't yeah. leave, he doesn't leave his basement. That's true. Or they could have a, something like a virtual debate or something. Yeah. See, Trump is a champion in dogfight. I don't like him. I'm telling you honestly. He's a champion in fighting, you know, light, like, you know, full bare knuckles. He knows no rules and regulations. Biden would be floundering because Biden has got too much skeletons in his cupboard if Donald Trump picks it up. But the problem is, George, what I don't understand, it's a choice again, like a bit of a deja vu in 2016 between Hillary and Trump, and now between Biden and Trump. None of them have got that respect for the common masses we can uplift them. But why is it so that the system in America is so corrupt that it's always, you know, a race for the worst when it comes to choosing the president in the last two elections? Well, uh, it sums up the state that America's in, uh, that its last two elections have been between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Uh, the... Mm -hmm. The, the worst candidate who ever ran for president uh, versus the second worst. Uh, <laughs> then you've got Joe Biden, a corpse, fighting a clown, uh, Donald Trump. So it speaks volumes about the state of the American empire. Uh, so what, what am I to say? It's got to be this. America needs a third party. America uh -huh. needs independence. If this is the best that the duopoly can produce time after time after time, then what use is the duopoly? That would be exactly. my point, Sarka. Uh -huh. Must I press on. One final thing yeah, last draft. point. You Go see, ahead. <laughs> see, with relations to the latest Israel-UAE thing, which Trump is trying to take the credit for, like, yeah. you know, about the, uh, this uh, recognition. Yeah. Now, do you think that will play to his favor because... I don't know, because you may hear an expert like, I would bet on you any day. Do you think he could use that to his favor to say that, look, I'm the diplomat trying to bridge gaps between various countries, which has never yeah, happened before? Uh, it's undoubtedly the UAE-Israel deal is undoubtedly a feather in Donald Trump's cap. Uh, it uh, is, uh, on the face of it, an extraordinary, epoch-making, uh, tectonic shift. And if it were to lead to a series of other Gulf countries also oh. recognizing Israel, uh, that would be a big boost to Donald Trump. It's an even bigger boost to Netanyahu, who is trying to stay out of jail and trying exactly. to stay in the prime minister's chair. 
when his deputy uh, supports him as the rope supports the hanging man. Uh, so it's good news for Trump and for Netanyahu, no doubt about that. Sarka, thanks for the call. Chris in Switzerland called up spoiling for a fight with me and then hung up and is now not answering his phone. Chris, what kind of man are you? You're telling the boys through there all that you're going to do to me once you get on air and then we can't reach you. Why did you put the phone down? Let's go to Chris in Colchester. Go ahead, Chris. All right, George. I, I thought mean, I was in Broadmoor. I thought I was in Broadmoor. <laughs> Are you in Broadmoor? <laughs> the ward's getting full up. <laughs> <laughs> well, how I just, do they I phone with the straight jackets on? That's what I don't understand. <laughs> do I can't tuck, let you know. I they can't tell you. Phone, I, tuck the phone under what? the chin or what? Well, we've got so many people in here now, we, 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 we've we learned to the use of phone, you know. Um, but I'm happy, you, to be your broad, you. I'm happy to be your Broadmoor correspondent. You're a star. Um, Good sport, Chris. Good sport. Happy birthday, George. Um, Thank you, so I don't want to fall. I don't want to fall out of you today. So, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I just say, um, regarding vaccines, or just one point is, I don't think uh, we should have this black or white view uh, because vaccines aren't always safe. Take the swine flu from 2009-2010 era. Um, there were actually damages paid out to people, uh, dozens of kids uh, that had narcolepsy from the swine flu, swine flu vaccine. Um, so it does worry me when we see this coronavirus vaccine rushed out uh, without the checks. Uh, in place, because we shouldn't be naive about it. You know, we've um, we've heard about Big Pharma in the U.S. and the power they have uh, stopping people having free uh, health care. So we should always challenge power and uh, the, the the merging of corporation and, and government. And we should always ask questions, I think. Chris, you are officially released from Broadmoor. You, <laughs> that was one of the best calls uh, of the entire night. Hallelujah. Amen to Cheers, George. all of that. Let's go to Washington, D.C., where, of course, Andy wants to talk about Scottish independence. Go ahead, Andy. Hello, Mr. Galloway. Good to talk to you again, sir. Um, I did call you up once before, and uh, I, I got disconnected. Yeah, I got disconnected. I didn't hang up on you or try to be rude. Okay, I do apologize okay, for that. go ahead. Um, I, I want to, uh, you know, I, I wanted to say that I agree with you completely regarding uh, 99% of what you say, especially regarding Israel-Palestine and uh, the Iran and the uh, UAE deal uh, that you've mentioned earlier in your show. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention uh, when we were speaking before, but I got disconnected, unfortunately, was that, um, you know, I do feel like during the referendum, I actually am a big observer of Scottish politics. I've actually visited Glasgow a couple times myself. We, I'm not Scottish, but I actually am a big fan of Scotland. And I have friends in Glasgow, so I've been very apprised of the political situation. I was watching uh, both sides of the advertisements for the campaign during the referendum. And I did notice that the UK, uh, or the No campaign, did uh, make many promises, I thought, to the people of Scotland, uh, including devolved powers and staying in the EU. And I remember a lot of fear-mongering basically saying that if uh, we vote no, or if we vote yes, then that means that Scotland won't be able to stay in the EU. But they well, voted no. If Scotland had voted yes, uh, they would have been now um, seven years, six years out of the EU. Uh, because the only way, the only reason that Scotland remained in the EU was because it voted to remain in the United Kingdom. Uh, the two things are entirely separate. Scotland voted... But are they? Well, the, uh, if you let me develop this answer, Scotland voted to remain in the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom voted to leave the EU. Uh, so it's sophistry, often employed, uh, to pretend that the subsequent decision by the whole of the UK to leave the European Union somehow justifies reopening a very divisive debate on Scottish independence that we were officially told 
would be a once in a generation, sometimes we were told it was once in a lifetime affair. Now, Andy, but that, unfortunately, that was a spin. That was not a legal precedent to say it was once in a lifetime. Uh, no, but it, what was a legal precedent was the Edinburgh Agreement, which stated that the referendum in 2014 would be decisive. Now, I know that we are two countries divided by a common language, but here, the word decisive means decisive. It doesn't mean decisive for four years or five years or six years. It means decisive. So if I were you, the Washington branch of the independence campaign, I'd hold on. I'd hold on to this once in a generation because you're lucky that I'm letting you away with that because otherwise I'd be saying, I'm sorry, decisive means decisive. And as you're calling me from a country that killed hundreds of thousands of people in your own land to stop I, I voted secession. against that at every turn. No, I personally no, no. voted against you that mis at every you opportunity. You misunderstood me. To avoid the secession of the southern part of your own country, you were ready to bathe the land in blood rather than allow the south to secede from the United States. It's a bit hard to take an American demanding secession in Britain. It's Norma. I definitely Bristol. don't think that Go my ahead, country Norma. has acted Close perfectly that on that Scottish them. nationalist in Washington down because there's a legend on the line. It's Norma in Bristol. Norma. Hello, George. Happy birthday. We Thank love you, hearing darling. your program. Thank you. But um, I got a couple of points. I know I haven't got much time. But You've got four <laughs> minutes. Okay. How much? <laughs> Four. Anyway, regarding your telling us about the VJ 75 years end of the war in Japan, mm. Mm. whilst I agree it was very cruel fascist regime and there was no apologies from them, but, you know, two weeks ago you interviewed an American professor who told us about the nuclear bomb dropped on Nagasaki, which was not needed as the Japanese was ready to surrender. They were pretty imminent. Anyway, what I wanted to say was, I just wanted to put a bit of balance because, as you know, thousands of Japanese civilians were massacred. And I saw a film recently, and I was almost in tears because I just saw a burning mother trying to save her burning, screaming child. But to no avail, they both died. And it's all vile, George. But yes, but, by, thing, uh, but, but Norma, by, yeah, by the time that the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, mm -hmm. Japanese fascism had already killed 20 million people, 10 million of them in China. So you cannot in any way uh, blunt my criticism of Japanese fascism by quoting the I fact think. that we then dropped a nuclear bomb on them. Can you? That's not fair, is it? Well, I don't know. I just thought that I, you know, I just said it, think it's all vile. It's all horrible. There is a peace park in Tokyo, I believe, which is very tranquil and, and people can meet there and they can be quietly reflective. Well, why don't and the Japanese compensate the, uh, the 20 million people that they killed? Oh, I, George, I can't even go into it. It's just that... You know, um, a peace park in, 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 uh, yeah. in Tokyo sounds nice, but uh, the people of China and of Korea and Vietnam and Malaya and so on were, were completely massacred. Mass yeah. murder, rape, uh, enforcement of women into sexual slavery, uh, the theft of their resources and so on. Uh, wouldn't it be good at least to say sorry for that? Absolutely, that's what I said to you. There's been no actual apologies from no. them, and I put that first of far all. Far less an atonement, yeah. far less compensation. But it's all pretty vile, and I'm glad we're where we are. Yeah. Just so quickly, uh, you will receive a letter that I received from CND, which I wasn't happy about, and I'm going to send it to you for your reading. Thank you very much indeed, Norma. No show is complete without Fagash Flow. If you're not following Fagash Flow, on Twitter, that's Norma in Bristol, you should right away do so. There's uh, no show without Norma. It's been marvelous for me, I hope it was for you. Looks like I'm getting a new hat for my birthday, 42% of you think I need one. 
a Galloway Tartan kill, only 20% of you want to see me in that. And a Dylan tattoo, nearly 38%. Wow, it's been marvellous. I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back next week at the same time and the same place. And if possible, bring another viewer, another listener with you. Good night.